I now declare the Plano City Council preliminary open meeting is reconvened in open session, that all council members are present. Our first item on the agenda is preliminary agendas is consideration and action resulting from the executive session. There will be none. Our next item is comprehensive monthly financial report for June 2022. Ms. Tacky. Good evening. I'm Denise Tacky. I'm the finance director for the city of Plano. I'm here to present the comprehensive monthly financial report for June of 2022, and that is our nine month mark getting into the year. So this slide represents our revenues compared to the budget by fund. The general fund has revenues of 270 million for the first nine months. That represents 92.2% of the total annual budget. The water and sewer fund has um, 127.2 million in revenues, which Sorry. represents 70. Okay. I don't have a super loud voice, but can you hear me now? A little better. <laughs> Our speakers aren't working here at the dais, so we're 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 having trouble hearing you. Okay. So just Hang lean a, a little bit towards the mic and we'll okay. we'll fight through it. Let me let me try and see if I can get a little bit louder. <laughs> so the water and sewer fund has 127.2 million in revenues. That represents 71.4% of the total annual budget. Here we have our expenditures compared to budget. By fund, the general fund has expenditures of 193.3 million for the first nine months of the fiscal year. This represents 65.9% of the total annual budget. The water and sewer fund has expenditures of 97.7 million, which represents 69.1% of the total annual budget. This slide represents our net change in fund balance for the past three years. In the general fund for the first fiscal Nine, the first nine months of the fiscal year, the fund balance has increased by 46.3 million. This is trending above where we were at this same time the prior fiscal year. A lot of that has to do with the ARPA funding and things that have come in this year. The water and sewer fund balance has decreased by 1.4 million. This is a better position than we were in the prior year. It's not really where we wanna be in the water and sewer fund right now but um, we are looking a little better than we were at this time last year. The Envir Environmental Waste Services Fund has decreased by 2.8 million, and the Municipal Drainage Fund has increased by 64,000. When we're looking at our general fund revenue actuals compared um, to the prior fiscal year, we're up by $14.5 million. Our property taxes are actually somewhat flat compared to the prior fiscal year, but our sales tax revenue has come in strong this year and has increased by $11.9 million over the first nine months of the prior fiscal year. There was also a, an increase in building permit revenues of $2.1 million and franchise fees of $1.1 million. Several other categories of revenue showed a rebound from the prior fiscal year. Um, and these were all offset by a decrease in interest income. And what caused that is the mark-to-market adjustment required by Governmental Accounting Standards Board um, Statement Number 31. And those are unrealized losses, which we won't, re we will never realize them because we always hold our um, at our investments to the maturity in the portfolio. Our general fund expenditures are higher than the prior fiscal year by 4.5 million. Personnel costs increased by 6.9 million due to the 3% salary adjustment effective in October of 2021. Um, last year's personnel costs were offset by CARES funding. This year's personnel, off, or personnel costs are offset by ARPA funding. Costs for materials and supplies increased by 12 million. So we're beginning to see the effects of the inflation on these costs. So it's something to keep an eye on. And our contractual and professional fees increased by 
4 million due to higher information service charges and increased fuel charges. And um, that's all we have for that one. Our health claims fund had a decrease in fund balance of about 7.9 million compared to last year. This is mostly due to an increase in expenses. We've talked about this the last couple quarters. We saw this where people were not going to the doctor and then they started to go after post COVID and our, our health expenses have just gone um, pretty high. Our policy is to keep six months of claims plus our IBNR in the fund balance and that's about what we'd like to have about a $12 million fund balance. But right now our fund balance is at 8.7 million. So we have in, increased the employer contributions starting in March, and there will be premium increases for the employees in our next plan year. Our unemployment rates in March were at 2.8%, and they have increased to 3.3% in June. Of course, our sales tax is still a very good story. In the month of July, it was up compared to the prior year by 17.1%. The real estate market continues to be strong. The number of days on the market was 12 in March. This compared to 15 in June, so there isn't a lot of change. The percent of asking was 110% in March and has decreased slightly to 107% in June. This is the most I've seen it stay over 100% like consistently for months, so. And then our median selling price for a home in Plano was 540,000 in March compared to 570,000 in June. Keep in mind that's median, not mean, because we got different data set sets. So what we're looking at is a little bit different than the way we used to talk about it. Um, the price per square foot in March was at 222 compared to 229 in June. So you're seeing that price per square foot is inching up a little bit as well. Hotel occupancy tax is up by 3.2 million compared to the prior fiscal year. Um, the industry it continues to um, improve. And then our equity and treasury pool, of course that's our investment por portfolio, what funds really hold all of those investments. Of course our largest one is going to be capital projects. This month in particular, we received all of those bond proceeds, and so the capital projects is over a third of what our equity and treasury pool is. Followed by enterprise funds, which is water and sewer and municipal drainage, and then the um, general fund. And then our portfolio book value is now at 764.8 million. And as you can see, the timing of our maturities is spread out so that we have the um, appropriate liquidity that we need in the portfolio. And then our diversification, of course, we're always very diversified. We cannot have more than 50% of any one type of investment in the portfolio. And our muni investments are at 45.73%. So we're pulling back on those and trying to pick up a couple of different um, investment opportunities. Of course, our investments are all backed by the full faith and credit of the United States government. So they're always very safe investments. And I'll be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Denise. Any, any questions in regard to her presentation? Thank you. Thank you. The next item is discussion direction uh, regarding the Stream Bank Stabilization Program. Caleb? All right, good evening. Caleb Thornhill, Director of Engineering. I uh, have with me tonight Allison Smith and Russell Erskine in, uh, from our engineering department. And we wanted to follow up uh, on our discussion back in March of the stream bank stabilization program we currently have in place. Uh, if you'll recall, that meeting was March 28th, the preliminary open. Uh, we have been receiving some concerns from citizens, uh, particularly for private properties. And so we had uh, had a discussion here. We had, you guys had several questions. We've gone back and done a little bit of due diligence and we wanted to present that information to you tonight. 
Uh, part of that will be discussing what some of the surrounding communities uh, do for their stream bank stabilization. We'll talk briefly about some alternatives and the potential impacts of those uh, depending on how we move forward. So first, we've put together a table and we tried to put this t table together about three or four different ways and uh, this is what the result was. But essentially, anywhere you see an asterisk is uh, uh, a caveat, I guess I should say. So um, what you'll see there is the entities or cities there on the left um, and then you'll see private property, HOA responsibility, and whether the city or um, uh, provides any assistance for those uh, different entities. And then some notes there. So obviously we talked about Plano last time. Uh, the current ordinance and drainage manual, the way it's written is we do not provide assistance for private property or HOA. However, there's an asterisk, meaning if it shows up on the plat that the uh, maintenance responsibility is not named and who that is, and the city takes care of that. Uh, so most of our plats indicate who is responsible for the maintenance. Uh, if it's an HOA or if it's the property owner, it's very clear. Um, years prior to that, though, it just didn't say anything. And when we have those cases, we take the maintenance responsibility of that. Uh, City of Dallas, uh, again, their ordinance uh, currently states that they do not provide assistance for private property or HOA. However, there's an asterisk uh, because they will include properties, uh, private properties, if it's a, a part of a larger project. So if they're doing a uh, erosion protection for a large section of stream and there's a couple of properties that need assistance through there, they will include that. Uh, so again, they've got an asterisk there. Richardson uh, is again, no and no. However, there's an asterisk as they have a program where if the citizen pays $5,000, they will provide assistance. Uh, and at the commercial, uh, they have a program where it's 50-50. So if you went and straight and looked at their ordinance, they say they do not do it, but our staff has coordinated with them directly and they do provide some assistance. Uh, Garland is a yes and yes. They provide assistance to private property and uh, HOAs. However, uh, they have a program that's a cost sharing. Uh, so the non-residential or commercial is a 3367, one third, two third, where the city pays one third, the uh, commercial pays two thirds, and residential is a 50-50. Uh, there's another asterisk here for Garland because they also have uh, higher drainage fees for people that live along waterways. Um, and uh, in talking with their staff, apparently they're trying to move away from that, but that's the way they currently operate. Frisco, no asterisks, is a no and a no. Uh, they don't provide any assistance, um, but they have performed an extensive uh, stream bank study uh, for their entire system. And uh, we'll talk a little bit more about that in a few minutes. Uh, McKinney is a no and a no, but they have an asterisk as they've got uh, in their documentation that they will consider will consider uh, if it is a safety concern, a life safety concern. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit about that because the concern we have on that is the safety and how you define that. Uh, Arlington was a no and a no. So I wanted to do a real brief case study to, so you could see what we've tried to consider. Uh, the partial layer you see there in all blue is uh, one that's actually uh, we have, where we have looked at. And uh, in order for us to evaluate, and again, these would be case by case based on the individual parcels, but one of the things that we have to consider is if we are going to do improvements on private property, um, how are we going to accomplish that with uh, the current rules that are in place? So, for instance, in this location, what we would likely have to do is bisect that property. Uh, so the red would then be owned by the city of Plano, be dedicated to the city of Plano. The yellow or the greenish color um, would still be obviously owned by the property owner. Um, but the unintended consequences of that, that allows us the right to put improvements on that property now since we obviously own it. Um, but what that now does is create conformance issues with the zoning. Um, this lot, uh, based on the current zoning, has to have a 9,000 minimum square foot. It exceeds that, uh, but it no longer meets the rear setback or the lot uh, depth for this, so there would be challenges uh, depending, again, on the case-by-case -case basis, but this is just one example we wanted to show that we've looked at. Uh, I mentioned the study that uh, Frisco had performed, um, and 
and I won't read all of this. I know it's a lot of text, and I hate seeing slides with tons of text, but I wanted to include it in your packet. Um, this, a couple of our neighbors have done this assessment study, and this is something that we would like to propose and, uh, for the city of Plano. Now, it is very extensive. It is a three-year process. Uh, they can only take assessment during the winter, obviously less foliage, uh, so they can have a better understanding of the erosion concerns. We have approximately 120 miles of creek. So again, that's why it does take upwards of three years. Uh, this would be a collaborative. We would share these results with Public Works, Parks, the other departments. Um, the consultant would do a study and essentially what we showed you last time from a stream make a stable stabilization, they would perform a score sheet for every parcel throughout the city. Um, Obviously, we do not have the, the capacity to do something like this, so we would uh, recommend um, having a consultant uh, assist us with this. But what that would do is it would give us a database, and I think uh, Council Member Two mentioned this last time, how um, extensive is our issue with Stream Bank in the city? And right now, honestly, we don't know what it is. The, our program is 100% reactive. Um, if a citizen calls, we go out, we do an evaluation, we may look upstream, downstream, across the stream to determine that, um, but that's the extent of our program. Uh, and this would essentially give us a database that would show us citywide how extensive our erosion concerns are. Uh, and again, uh, it would help us planning for those CIP projects and budgeting in the future. Uh, the last slide is alternative options, however you want to look at that. The first one, again, is that assessment throughout the city. Uh, it is, uh, again, a three-year process. Uh, it is very expensive, uh, as you can imagine, to have a three-year project. Uh, but that's what we're recommending because beyond that, and even with the case study that I showed you, without knowing the extents of that uh, erosion throughout the city, we don't at this point, we have an educated assessment of what the budget impacts may be. But again, there's so many factors that impact uh, that we don't really have the tools at this point to develop what even the budget request would be from council. Um, we know that you would likely have to impact drainage rates, uh, increase those. Uh, we don't know for sure what the staff requirements would be to try to maintain some type of program. And obviously, depending on how many years you want to do it, um, how many projects we need to do on a yearly basis. But that assessment will provide the, the data so we can have that program and come back to you with what we feel like would be the recommends, uh, recommendations. Um, the other options that we have looked at, the life safety, again, that McKinney model uh, is something that we have considered. Uh, again, the challenge you face with that is how you define safety. Uh, if you have a 10, 15, 20 foot drop off adjacent to a bedroom window. That seems very clear to be a, a life safety, but if it's next to a garage, if it's next to a pool, if it's next to a gazebo, if it's at the end of your property, everybody is gonna see that differently uh, as far as how their property is safe. Um, so that is a struggle to, to say that we'll provide that assistance because everybody's gonna feel like, well, this is a safety issue for my property. Um, the other one we did talk about is uh, providing assistance for private properties and HOAs. Uh, again, this will have a, a direct impact to the current drainage fee if we uh, adopt uh, that some sort of policy like that. Um, you know, providing that assistance will uh, increase the rates for, again, those properties, citizens, and HOA currently. Uh, the revenue from the drainage fee is about a 50-50 split between residential and commercial. And if we did something uh, along those lines, it would just increase the residential since we're not increasing for uh, commercial as well. Uh, cost share program, again, we I mentioned Garland earlier. They're actually trying to get away from this. Uh, and again, some of these projects are extensive, uh, upwards of several hundred thousand dollars. So even the 50-50 cost share puts a huge burden on the property owner. Uh, and the last one I just put on here, we don't do anything, which I don't think is the, the, the right policy, but it is what some of the other cities are doing. Um, so with that, I believe that's my last slide, and we'll be happy to answer any questions, unless these are their speakers. That's okay. Let, let's ask the questions. Go okay. ahead, Councilmember Smith. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, Caleb, good to see you. 
Uh, yeah, I think uh, the the planning and the look and the catalog potential areas of, of uh, problems that can come up later is, is a great idea. Uh, that's a great long-term strategy. Uh, I do think you know, we do want to look at uh, some of the areas, some of the neighborhoods that may have a potential negative impact coming now that we uh, we heard about in March. Uh, one thing I want to remember, I, I think I'd ask you if we could to take a look at, uh, it was the one neighborhood I believe was the Indian uh, mm -hmm. or the Hills of Indian Creek that uh, was, it was kind of up in the air as to whether, you know, because the plat, whether it was our responsibility or their responsibility or whatever. And uh, what I'd suggest it is if it's unclear with this particular area to, to err on the side of the neighborhood and provide, you know, the city to take that over. Did, did we get a chance to review that anymore? And if so, what, what did you come up with? Yeah. So if I recall correctly, Indian Creek up in Northwest Plano, it's very clear on their plat who the responsible party is. It's the, the HOA's responsibility. Um, what is unique about that area and particularly that essentially block uh, is the opposite side of that channel is the city of Plano's responsibility. So it's one of these hybrid essentially situations where Plano has responsibility and has done projects in years past versus the other side where it's the HOA's responsibility. Um, what will be a challenge with that is uh, we have done extensive uh, research or uh, review of that area. Uh, Allison's been out there with uh, several members uh, that live in that area. And we have walked through, we actually put together a, a, a very brief report, or I say brief, it was about 100 something pages, and walked property by property. Um, the challenge with that area is currently a lot of those areas don't, they, while they meet the erosion control um, criteria, they do not rank high enough to initiate a project at this point. So they, if, even if that area was included uh, in our list, they would be towards the bottom of that list. Uh, and with this assessment, again, probably similar, there's areas that we just are not aware of, whether it's you know, water, sewer, drainage pipe, infrastructure, bridges, whatever it is, that may take a higher priority than what's on our current list. Um, so that would be an area that um, would likely fall in that category where they would, we've currently got 30 and I think Allison, you said when Frisco did their study, their list doubled or tripled? 54. For severe erosion. So it needed immediate addressing. The areas that we have evaluated, there's I think three that we felt like were a medium priority. Uh, and again, that was just a very cursory view. We uh, highly recommend an, an engineer going out and do that. <coughs> Those would be a medium versus you know, what we would expect would be several high priorities that would be in that list. Gotcha. But I, again, if, if something uh, were to develop more of a, to be more of a serious mm -hmm. nature, be whether it's a pool, you know, of course, if somebody's pool is getting ready to fall off into the, into the creek, that may not be a life safety issue, but it's certainly a bad issue for, you know, our, for our property owner who pays property taxes. And if that should happen, the value of the home goes down, the property taxes associated go down. So, I mean, it's a, it's a losing proposition for everybody. Mm -hmm. uh, so I would say I would, I, I'm, I'm good with the long range plan, uh, but um, I, I think we, we need to be ready and able to get involved in situations with individual HOAs or neighborhoods if, if necessary. And of course, I'll, I'll lean to our, our city manager uh, who yes, opinion and, I value quite uh, quite much, but and, uh, I, I just don't want us to just, let's plan it because I think too many times, large organizations, companies, municipalities, we spend a lot of time planning when I think we could spend more time solving you know, an issue, <laughs> at, least, at least initially so. And Caleb, correct me, but we will be continuing with our current program as we're doing this study. So it's not that we're not doing anything. We're continuing on our current program with those high priority aspects of things. But I want us to also be careful that we're not giving direction and precedent that says, let's go around what we're currently doing into an area that is neither uh, supported by the study necessarily or a departure from our current program. But I do think that we have the ability under our current program, if there is an emergency, to be able to react. And I'm seeing heads nod. So I, I feel like we will we'll be able to continue with that and make some progress on those projects. But 
this this thorough um, analysis from a, a planning perspective, Council, it's really important for us to understand the context and the the, the entirety of what we're going to be taking on as a city, because um, from a cost perspective, I have great concerns that this could have a significant uh, impact citywide. And as we're in the middle of budget, I know we're all price sensitive to uh, all costs, and, and this one could be quite large. So I want to make sure that we have great data before we um, change direction. So, Councilman Riccadelli. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, and Caleb, thank you for, for that great information. Uh, I, I too agree with uh, moving ahead with the study. I just wanted to get a feel for uh, how much do you think the study itself will cost? So again, we've based it based on a couple of our neighboring cities, but we expect it to be over a million dollars. Okay, thank you for that information. I'm, I'm sorry, Mayor Pro Tem. On your slide, slide four, the case study that you showed, would it be a potential solution if we, we got to this point and had a case like this um, where you had this um, situation arise to enter into a perpetual lease with the homeowner so that you didn't have to um, go through the zoning or have these issues? So the, and I'll, I'll say this, we had this slide very complicated uh, before with a lot of information and we tried to pull that back. But we've looked at several different aspects, whether it would be a rezoning, well, do you rezone one parcel? Because obviously probably the neighboring parcels are exactly the same situation when you would probably need to do the same. So it may be a, a zoning, it may be a BOA. Um, we've looked at a full out, just fee simple purchase of the property. Um, we've looked at a maintenance agreement and we've had some discussions with the, the legal department as far as what would be, I wouldn't say the easiest or cleanest, but what would be make the most sense for the city moving forward. The leasing, while it, it probably makes great sense, I'm not sure, you know, there's, there's a term at the end of that. So at the end of that term, you know, what happens? Um, so, but we're, we're open to anything. And again, we're having several discussions with legal and, you know, how do we spend public dollars on essentially private property or what steps we need to, to take to do that. Council member Williams. Um, <clears throat> thank you, Caleb. Um, I like the idea of, um, uh, property owners near stream banks, uh, paying higher drainage fee, um, I don't know what the drainage fee increase would have to be to basically pool the risk of 120 creek miles across the city, but I like the concept. I think it uh, merits looking into. For the study, I also like that. Um, would such a study, especially with a million dollar price tag, look at not just what's a problem now, but based on the layout and the trends of um, uh, erosion over the past couple of decades, tell us what is likely to be a problem in a couple of decades. I know so, that's, that's, yeah, I'm sorry to cut you off. Um, so the, the answer is yes. Uh, mm. and, and that's essentially what our staff mm. does now. Though, if they get a, a concern or a complaint that's brought up about erosion, they go out and do an evaluation and say, all right, well, it doesn't meet our program today. But obviously, if we're looking for a, a two to one slope and it's 2.09 to one right now, Technically, it doesn't meet the program, but we can see where it's probably going. As, again, similar to this, we would have that database of uh, the city's stream bank system and be able to determine while one score may not have scored quite high enough, we can see where the trend's going. So absolutely. Okay. And uh, thank you. And when it comes to uh, the terminology of maintain, you know, who, whose responsibility is it to maintain the stream beds? Do we have an actual definition for that that we employ? Is there a distinction between picking up the trash and clearing out overgrowth versus actual building retaining walls to stop uh, further erosion? So, uh, Russell, I don't know. You've studied the plats probably way more than anybody else. Do you want to give some examples of how that plat reads? I think what we do is if the plat says that it's the homeowner or private property owner's responsibility for maintenance for debris or anything like that, we don't let that go from there. Now, occasionally we will step in uh, if it kind of, kind of turns into maybe a little bit more of a drainage issue. I know recently I went out and the there were some couches that were in the creek that we had our public work staff go out and remove because it could be a future blockage of the creek upstream. So really we look at the plat language when we go through and that's what we'll be follow. 
That's a good example. I mean, clearing a couch or large debris out of a creek bed, um, that doesn't entail nearly the uh, effort as uh, shoring up eroding land. I mean, I'm thinking, actually, have we looked at uh, California law for this? The mudslides in California seem to be a recurring problem, and they cause vast devastation. I have not looked at California law. Okay. I apologize. No, no, no sweat. I wouldn't have, I didn't think about it until right now. So um, <laughs> I think, uh, yeah, because that's, that's the kind of situation I'm afraid of um, where whole houses are lost. Yep. I mean, a pool's bad enough, but if a pool going makes it easier for a, uh, an actual house to go, that's even right. worse. Um, uh, Councilman Riccadelli already addressed that one. Oh, for um, instances where, to the Mayor Pro Tem's point in the case study, uh, for instances where a property is no longer going to be com in compliance with zoning, um, if we uh, if we take uh, possession of the land to do um, improvements, uh, isn't there a, a fairly straightforward uh, variance process we could employ to bring the property into compliance? Yeah, so we have talked with the planning department on what a what if scenario and what I think we were told was the a BOA, a board of adjustments is we could do an individual parcel or location um, to, to do that. Obviously, and I think Mark touched on this earlier is the, the precedence is the concern because while that makes perfect sense for an existing parcel that, you know, half their backyards falling into the Creek, if somebody new comes in and says, I want to lay out my lots based on what you did at this property, well, that was, there was a reason we did it that way. Well, I need to do it as well because the channel is encroaching on my property and I can't. So it's, it's a challenge either way, but yeah. Sure. Okay. Well, I, I like the idea of the study um, and I would like to explore uh, the increased drainage fee for viability. Thank you. Deputy Mayor. So um, I, I have a, f a few Silly questions, I guess. So first of all, the um, $1 million price tag, is that for the three years of the study that mm -hmm. um, that's entailed? That's all 120 miles. So you think that the, most of the money is going to spend up front or most of the money is going to be in the back end? I think it'll be throughout the process. So they're, they're going to have to cover, obviously, 120 miles. Uh, they will likely do that in thirds, essentially. Um, if for the depending on the season so you know for instance if we started that sometime this fall mm -hmm. they would cover out of 120 you know 40 miles or so uh, and then I'm, I'm guessing we have not reached out to anybody we just got some ballpark numbers for budget purposes um, but then they could have that data to start converting it to a database and then while the next season's rolling around so it would be kind of incrementally so my second question would be um, yeah, it's a great idea to have a general knowledge about our city and the stream bank. And it's a great idea to have an assessment. Um, if it's going to be made public, you think this is going to affect some of our neighbors who may have issues with regard to, you know, where there's potential damages that might be? I mean, how are you planning on dealing with some of the possible concerns that may arise due to the fact that we are doing these general assessments. Yeah, it, and it's a really good point. And honestly, I haven't thought about it. I mean, we essentially do that now when we put together a three or five year CIP program with the streets or water lines or whatnot we need to replace. So to me, it would be along those same lines, but you know, how, what the impacts may or may not be to, to private citizens, uh, it's, it's a tough one to answer. Well, the issue is, some of them, uh, some of the, uh, the the areas are covered by city, mm -hmm. and some of them are required by HOA or private, um, privately responsible. So when you start having these assessments, where oh well, this area probably will have, um, you know, potential issues in you know five or ten years. Um, I think there may raise some concerns, so I, I just want to make sure that you know we we think about that prior to start um, making these reports and um, and and not taking into consideration of how that would affect our city. So, okay. I, th I think staff in in our discussion we realize a, a lot of the potential liability with this, and we'll be sensitive to to the way that it comes back. But we want to be fully transparent when we do come back, so that the public is aware. Shelby. 
Um, obviously, we're fascinated with gullies, and we want to talk about them. Um, so let me ask a couple of just really weird questions. Um, the water that flows through our streams, do we own it, or is it the owned by the Army Corps of Engineers? Russell, you would like to respond to that? It really kind of depends on the definition, but it's state of Texas water first and foremost. And then from there, city of Dallas has water rights to White Rock Creek and Rowlett Creek. So they're the senior water rights holder. So there's, and if Mary comes down to the next step below that. So, so, so their water is destroying our stream banks. Is that what we're saying? <laughs> I guess you're in a roundabout way. You can say, say Texas water is just, just, you know, everybody's always looking for the deeper pocket on these things. And I mean, the homeowner's looking for us. I'm just trying to figure out where the deeper pocket is that you know, could, could reimburse some of these things. And if it's from, from a federal or a state standpoint, the, the real question is what is the cost of a project, say, for every linear mile of, of stream bank? Um, Allison, do you remember? I think we've got it per linear foot, an average. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, we can definitely get that number. Just curious because obviously we have two sides. So if you have 120 mm -hmm. miles, you've got 240 miles you have to cover on both sides of it, times 5,280 feet, times whatever the cost is per linear foot. Um, we we could be really looking at billions of dollars if we have to do this. Yeah, and obviously we don't intend or expect to address both sides every single mile. Yeah, uh, and that's the concern that I have is the read on some of this might be that we would be doing all of the banks all the time everywhere. Right. And that's the concern that I have that I think that the city has as well is that you can get into a situation where we couldn't even afford it. Mm -hmm. Neither could they. So Dallas and the state of Texas is destroying our stream banks. <laughs> I stand on that. <laughs> At least we have some speakers. Um, uh, would it make sense to explore actually defining what we mean by maintain? Because Councilman Grady's right. If we had to shore up uh, uh, effectively 240 um, linear miles of stream bank, that's going to be incredibly cross prohibitive. But I don't. To your point, I don't think anybody anticipates that we're actually going to have to do that. But to help prioritize. Um, if we define what maintain means and we leave the debris removal to property owners and HOAs, et cetera, but if, if there is, uh, uh, say that if uh, life or property are imperiled by serious erosion, uh, then that deviates from the other definition of maintain and then it becomes something the city has to look at. So we currently have that in place and that's how we assess a score. So if somebody calls us, and I believe we had the slide, I didn't include it with this one. If somebody calls us about an erosion concern or a stream bank concern, we have a score sheet that we've uh, put together. And, that, and on that score sheet is, you know, proximity to utilities, you know, water, sewer, drainage, uh, proximity to a structure. Uh, so we have those uh, criteria in place. So if we go out and do an evalu evaluation and none of those boxes are checked and the slope is three to one, it's you know, not looking great, but it, it's still holding up. We don't, you know, it's in, you know, we're starting to see limestone or shale or whatever, not any additional erosion anticipated, then you know, we'll have that for our information and move on to the next parcel. Well, I'm just talking about the actual definition of maintain. I know I, I understand we have the program, and, that's, right. and I understand it's also necessarily reactive right. at this point. So if there is a healthy stream bank, we will not add any additional maintenance to it. Uh, okay. We won't add any gabions, anything like that. Okay. Thank you. Appreciate it, Caleb. Thank right. you. Thank you. I think we have some speakers for this item. Go ahead. We do. The first one is Brent Emke. I'm Brent Emke, president of the Hills of Indian Creek HOA. Around 40 years ago, the city of Plano implemented a subdivision ordinance <clears throat> change requiring the city and the developer to agree on the ownership of a development's creek bank easement. The ownership choices were either the city, an individual, or an HOA. 
<clears throat> there was no written criteria on the factors of what should be considered. The decision became a negotiation. The decision was made before any lot was sold, a house was built, or an HOA formed. Now, after 40 years, the individuals and HOAs that were assigned this responsibility <clears throat> are reporting erosion issues that are impacting individual lots and structures and asking the city for help. 38 years ago, our HOA development was the first in the area along a natural creek. Our developer's plat map assigned the creek bank easement to the owner's association. For the latter developments across the creek and upstream, the developers and the city agreed that oh, the city would be the owner of the creek bank. These developments, along with the other upstream developments, increase the stormwater runoff that goes into our creek. Our plat map states the city has no responsibility for, uh, for erosion when in fact the surrounding and upstream developments are the resulted in the increased water flow that is causing the erosion. All Plano property owners, including our HOA members, pay a drainage fee, that's the fund Plano Stream Bank Stabilization Projects. Yet our HOA is expected to maintain our stream bank while the city maintains the adjacent stream bank and the upstream stream bank with our drainage fees. Totally unfair. At the last meeting, Mr. Thornhill reported HOAs and individuals are assigned 8.6 miles of the entire 120 miles of Plano Creeks. Tonight's engineering recommendation expands the project beyond the initial scope, which was, should the ch city change the policy and accept the additional 8.6 miles it doesn't already have the responsibility for? I ask you not to lose sight of that original scope in considering your decision. All stormwater runoff ultimately flows into a creek or stream. These creeks and streams are therefore citywide infrastructure that all citizens rely on. For the sake of fairness and consistency for all of its citizens, the city should change the existing policy. I urge you to wait no longer and make the change to the policy and accept the stream banks along residential areas. Mr. Mayor, could I make one, ask for one more minute to address uh, Congress, uh, Congressman, Council Member Smith's comment earlier? I haven't heard the beeper go, so oh, I, I saw a light. I saw a light go Did on. Did it? Oh, so I can continue. Continue. Let's compromise. I'll give you forty. <laughs> Thank you. So you you asked the question about our HOA and and Mr. Thornhill's right. Our uh, plat map says the the HOA is responsible. What I brought up the last time is the city zoning. Uh, for our whole development, which is over 900 houses, was to have one single HOA responsible to share in any cost. The developer went bankrupt, the Resolution Trust took over, um, everybody lost sight, the, the city of, uh, or the tax assessor of Collin Creek, or Collin County, assigned us the, the, the plat or the responsibility when we never received the deed. So I agree, it's on the plat map, but there's a question of, do we really own it? The city never enforced a single HOA, and we have 122 homes in our HOA that only 20 houses are on the creek. And because we were the first one, we also are responsible for two creek banks on the other side that belong to another HOA, which when Allison was out there pointed out, the one needs addressing, which would mean our HOA is supposed to fund the, uh, the work on another HOA's property member, HOA properties member uh, property. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker is Matthew Kingsley. We will move on to Joey Seven. Walk down. 
Good evening. My, my name is Joey Seven. My wife, Marilyn, and I have lived at uh, 2520 Napperton Drive in Plano, Texas for over 18 years. Thank you for listening to the city, uh, citizens of Plano that tells us you care. You've heard of, from our, my fellow homeowners in, in the States of Wooded Cove at the March 28th City Council meeting that we are a responsible community here in Plano, uh, Plano citizens. The estate at Wooded Coves is a community of 158 homes located south of McDermott and west of Custer Road. Thank you again for allowing me to speak to you. I firmly believe that you have been elected into your position to solve problems. And ladies and gentlemen, we have a problem. I need your help to address, we need your help to address the stream bank erosion within the estates of Winter Cove, provide a safe environment for our families to prevent the loss of life, property damage caused by erosion. The uh, drainage flow th that is of concern to our HOA debt originates from a drainage culvert at the north end of, our prop of the uh, drainage area, which is, I believe, about a four and four foot, maybe larger diameter uh, culvert, very large. It has been reported that during a heavy rain, water flows through that culvert at a very fast and dangerous speed. Can you just imagine how much water comes through there? There are several other drainage culverts feeding the water flow as well. During the March 28th uh, <clears throat> City Council meeting, our HOA was aware of two sites where the er erosion, in our opinion, was quite significant. Uh, the engineering department has been out and looked at it, thanks to Russell. I think Russell's been out there a couple times. And reported to this, and we have a third site just reported last week to the city engineering department. So therefore, our request is that the city of Plano, number one, fund the needed erosion reinforcement behind the most severe site within the estate at Wooded Cove on Barber Oaks as soon as possible, because the stream bank edge is about four feet away from the homeowner's back fence and about 15 feet from a swimming pool. Now, to add a little bit more to that is we've had evidence of kids back there playing and maybe some people sneaking back there smoking a cigarette. But you can imagine what would happen if it was a, a major runoff and somebody slips into the high speed of water flowing through there. Very dangerous. So the second thing is to prevent future catastrophes, monitor and manage the assessment of other sites in the assessment of what it goes on Quentin Point Drive to determine when it needs to be addressed. And third, create a policy, like my, the previous, spe uh, previous speaker, create a policy that would not leave the management and repair of water damage erosion to the individual HOAs because the cost for stream bank reinforcement is very expensive, very expensive. For example, to get an engineering estimate to reinforce one of our current problems, Mr. our Seven. HOA already paid. Mr. Seven. Your time's up, but oh. I'll, I'll give you another 30 seconds oh, if thanks, you'll sir. wrap it up. So I, I, one more bullet. The, but basically, we already paid $10,000 just for an engineering estimate. And finally, please recommend how we can help you and the Stream Bank program to successfully to be successful all throughout Plano going forward. And thank you for your attention to this matter. Thank you. Well, we were we're uh, we're needing to give some direction uh, uh, to Caleb, and and obviously without really having an idea of what we're looking at, uh, a, a citywide assessment is is critical for us to even know what we're talking about, and then understanding areas of, of uh, need immediately, and then those areas that can can you know be taken care of down the road. But I think. Uh, the citywide stream bank erosion assessment is critical to us understanding what we're even talking about. Yeah, I, I agree with doing the study. I'd also like, hopefully from the study, we can have a, a definition of what safety means. And um, I think that's important for us to know when an area is at risk and needs us to get involved in. I'm sure you all have already done this, but it would be wonderful if we could find mm. some sort of grant money out there to help with the study because a million dollars is a lot for a study. So 
you could magically find that, that would be wonderful. <laughs> Oh, if, if I may, uh, Mr. Mayor, thank you. Uh, and I, I like the idea of magically finding a million dollars as well. I will, I will second that. Uh, and uh, no, but uh, also, uh, as we do this study, I think it would be important to note um, areas where erosion has been either caused or worsened by man-made improvements, especially if they're city improvements. Uh, both of the speakers alluded to drainage culverts that funnel water in a certain way, and and obviously, I, I think that would, you know, also be relevant to the analysis of what the city should be taking on. If we've if we've done something that is, you know, redirected water that's creating an issue that didn't exist naturally, that would that would certainly be relevant. Yeah, I think that's a really great point. I, I think the, I will tell you there will be unintended consequences with that as we, will find, I'm sure several areas that have unpermitted obstructions in the stream. Uh, that's one of our, I would say that but between that and erosion are our chief complaints. Somebody from across the stream will say they did this in the creek and they can't do that. So it'll be a part of that evaluation as well. well nonetheless, it'll be, you know, good to have all information and then, then you know, hopefully good decisions can flow from, from having all of, all of the information. So thank you. Councilman Williams. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Um, I agree. I think we should move forward with the study um, and with the existing fund, as you pointed out, we can uh, continue with what we're doing at the same time. Um, I'd like to um, get an updated assessment of the most critical spots in our city that need uh, addressing and to see uh, whether our current fund can address those. And if not, what's the gap? Smith. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, I just want to say I think again the study study is good because uh, we need to know where where we have problems now and where we might have problems down the road. But I, again, I don't want us to lose sight of current pressing issues that may be developing. And I would encourage our homeowners that uh, feel like they are having some potential safety issues. Let us know. Stay on top of us. Keep keep that wheel squeaking so we know about it. And for our engineering folks, is again, if there's a question, err on the side of the, of our homeowners. And if there's something that you don't feel comfortable with, bring it back to us and let us deal with it. Okay. Are we all good with the uh, direction? You good with that? I'll keep looking for that money tree. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Right. Uh, I would like to suggest to Councilman Grady that if we did need to shore up 240 linear miles of stream bank, maybe we could repurpose those funds and build a moat around Plano. <laughs> <laughs> I, wish I always and thought I a fence along one. No. <laughs> <laughs> and it, I actually do have just one more clarification because Councilmember Smith raised a good point. I just want to make sure, I think I heard you say earlier, Mark, under our current program, we can address emergency situations. Is that correct? So I, I think that's, that, that, that helps correct. get us through the that's study correct. period and then, you know, continue addressing emergency situations, obviously. So thank you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, next item uh, is item four, consent and regular agendas. Everybody okay with that? Next item, council items for discussion and future agendas. Mr. Mayor, I'd like to ha add one item uh, on that. I would like to have a future discussion on the use of CDBG home and Buffington grant funds. No, I'll, I'll second that. Okay. Got it. Got it. With that, we'll take a recess and return at 7 o'clock.
I now declare that the Plano City Council is reconvened in open session, that all members are present. We'll begin tonight's regular meeting with the invocation led by Patrick Iga, missions pastor with the Legacy Church, and the Pledge of Allegiance and Texas Pledge led by Cub Scout Pack 1220 with Hedgecoats Elementary. Would you please rise? Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we are so grateful for moments and meetings such as these that we can come together as a community and bring our petitions, our requests, our concerns in a free environment such as this. But it's at this very moment that we ask, Lord, for your presence to be here with us this evening. We ask, Lord, that in all the decision-making that goes on tonight or the conversation that goes on tonight, we ask for your peace, the peace that passes all understanding. We ask for your wisdom, Lord, the wisdom that only comes from you. And in all of this, we lean not on our own understandings, but Lord, in all our ways, we pray that we acknowledge you in everything so that you can guide us in this great city to keep the path and the course of the city straight. We look to you and lean on you at this very moment. We pray for all the leaders here at this very moment, asking that you guide them. You guide them with your hand and your provision. It's in your name that I pray, Jesus. Amen. Please join us in reciting the Pledge of Allegiance and the Texas and the Texas flag. <laughs> Ready? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Honor the Texas flag. I pledge allegiance to the Texas. One state, one God, one and indivisible. Thank you. Be seated, please. Hey, guys. Hey. I want you to have one of my special magic <laughs> mayor pencils. Which one do you want? Purple. Oh, blue. blue. See, I told you, Lisa. Blue. blue. That's good. Okay, let's take a pic. Can we take a picture right here? Face that one. Turn around. Everybody, come here. Come back. Oh, you're so tall. You can stand back here with me. Yeah, there you go. All right, yeah, please. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Which way are we looking? Right here. All right. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Thank you so much. Yes. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you so much. I really it. I know it's that time of the year when uh, kids are back to school because we finally get our Cub Scouts and our Scout Troop to lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. So we're very excited. 
Tonight, uh, we're also honored that the Plano Pub Public Library has been awarded two American Library Association PR Exchange Awards. So I'd like to call forward Libby Holtman, director of the Plano Public Library, and all the library managers and staff, please come down and join us. Now I'm gonna hand this over to Libby so you can tell us all about these awards. Okay, I'd love to, um, thank you. Do you need that? Sure. Okay. Well, actually, no, these are your words, sir, so I'll just. <laughs> I thought there was something special. I'll that. actually let the team talk about it. I'm delighted to um, be here on behalf of libraries. We have Tammy Corns, who's the Outreach and Engagement Manager. So I'm actually going to let her talk about this. This is the work her team does in concert with our communications team in this city. Thanks. In addition to, as the words pass, in addition to planning outreach that takes the library out into the community, which is our main focus, our outreach and engagement team is also, we have the privilege of promoting the library because we have these wonderful resources of five libraries in Plano and so we want everyone to know all about it. So our goal is to share resources, materials, 3,000 plus programs a year, and of course the best resource of all our wonderful, welcoming, supportive staff. So our annual report is something that showcases the value of the library and gives a recap of our year, so that's on our website. And then our e-news is a nice monthly quick reminder that we send out and shows you all that's going on in the five libraries for that upcoming month. And if you're not one of the almost 100,000 people already subscribed, we hope you will because now it's award-winning and you wanna be part of an award-winning e-news. So. We are proud of the national recognition and um, look forward to more in the future. Let's give them a hand. Thank you. Let's take a picture. Ooh, the yellow shoes together. I know. Get those shoes. Wow. They bring joy. Thank you. Thank you, guys Thank you so sir. Much. Thank you. Thank you. Comments of public interest? Comments of public interest. This portion of the meeting is to allow up to three minutes per speaker with 30 total minutes on items of interest or concern and not on items that are on the current agenda. The council may not discuss these items but may respond with factual or policy information. The council may choose to place the item on a future agenda. And we do have several speakers this evening. The first one is Bill France. Good evening, Mayor Munns, members of City Council. My name is Bill France. I'm a 25-year resident of Plano, and tonight I'm here representing the Plano, Texas Neighborhood Coalition. We are here again tonight to voice our concerns regarding the unlawful operation of short-term rentals in Plano's single-family residential neighborhoods. At this time, I ask all of our supporters to please stand. First, we are extremely concerned that the proposed registration process will be regarded as an irrevocable authorization to operate an STR in our neighborhoods. We ask that this assertion be strictly and emphatically denied. Second, we contend that Article 14 of the existing zoning ordinance clearly prohibits every type of commercial lodging operation in single family residential zones and that the lack of enforcement of this law in the past does not preclude any future enforcement or prohibition. Furthermore, grandfathering of any existing STR operation should never occur. Just because we haven't enforced the law does not make this legal. Lastly, we ask council to immediately enact a ban and a moratorium on any new short-term rentals in Plano. No lawful conditions exist that constrain our city from acting. 
You are not constrained by the filings of the state attorney general. They are not the law of the land. The cities of Arlington, Grapevine, Hearst, and New Braunfels have all successfully banned short-term rentals in residential neighborhoods. And against many challenges, they have held firm in our courts. The great many good and lawful citizens of Plano should not be continuously harmed due to the blatant disregard of the law by outside investors who view Plano neighborhoods as a place to operate a hotel business rather than what they legally are, our residential neighborhoods. Thank you very much for listening and for representing the law-abiding residents of Plano. Thank you, sir. The next speaker is Norwood Story. Mayor Munns, excuse me, I gotta get my glasses on. <laughs> and the members of the city council, good evening. My name is Norwood Story. I've lived in Plano for 42 years, and tonight I'm here to ask for your help. We all hope to live in peace with our neighbors. For the last two years, I've been living on a street that has a short-term rental. Tonight, as I describe my experiences, I would like for you to imagine how you would feel with this going on on your street. Loud noise late at night. Cars parked all up and down the street. That in itself is not unreasonable, but what came with it is. How about trash thrown in people's yards when they leave the party? Items stolen from neighbors' yards. Drug deals witnessed on the street in front of the party house. Party goers drinking alcoholic beverages in the street out in front of the house. Renters using the alley as a parking spot, 30 plus minutes at a time, blocking the alley for those that need it to get in and out of their homes. Over 20, recorded police incidences within a six month period. Many incidents weren't, weren't recorded because there was not a call sent to the police. It was just a complaint to our police liaison later on that week. The owner lives out of state and has no ties with Plano. Numerous city ordinances have been violated. Parking over a dozen cars in the grass in the backyard. It's a big backyard and it was big enough to fit 20 cars in it. Commercial vehicles parking on residential streets overnight. And an overgrown yard to the point that the city had to hire a service to get the grass cut. To the best of my knowledge, the owner has not been held responsible for any of this and has never been fined for any, any reason whatsoever. You wonder, how did they get away with this? Because we're not enforcing our laws. Commercial lodging operations don't belong in Plano's single family neighborhoods. They're not allowed there, they never have been, and they never should be. I ask you, please enforce our zoning laws to prevent these short term rentals from continuing and growing. Any action that'll increase the number of STRs in our city will put further strain on the city seconds. departments and the police department handling these types of violations. I trust that you will take these comments into consideration as discussions continue on this subject. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, sir. The next speaker is, the next speaker is Benjamin Sow. Good evening, uh, good evening, Mr. Mayor, uh, council members. My name is Ben, and I'm uh, here to rap for you guys tonight. Just kidding. Uh, I'm here to say that Plano is the best city in the country. Now, I might be biased because I grew up here, um, but the way people and corporations have flocked here um, shows that my standpoint is abundantly clear and obvious. My parents immigrated from Taiwan 30 plus years ago. Uh, they were very specific on where they wanted to raise a family and they want the city that, to be safe, to have amazing schools, 
they wanted to have a good community uh, with neighbors that could one day be friends because they were very far away from home. So thanks to their foresight and meticulous searching, me and my siblings were able to grow up here in Plano. We had the privilege to grow up here. And since I've graduated from Plano East, I've lived in a few different cities. I've lived in Austin, where there's never a dull moment. I've lived in San Jose, where I could go snowboarding just three hours away. And I've lived in Houston, where I ate a lot. <laughs> and I met my fiance. And we started talking a lot about our own future, family, kids, where we wanted to grow up. And it was very obvious, Plano was the best out of all. Uh, so we moved back to my childhood home with my parents. And everything seemed to be as expected. The community activities and services I remembered as a child were still around. I had a lot of friends starting to move back. One he's, uh, even became a teacher here at PSD. Um, but something was amiss. And for a while, my parents had been complaining about a noisy neighbor. Um, but I don't call them a neighbor because what they are is a residential home that's been taken over by a corporation um, and leased out on a daily basis as a hotel. Sometimes it's filled with a nice family. Sometimes it's a house party. But every time, it's filled with strangers that we've never been, met before. And instead of a feeling of safety and comfort that we had grown up with, my parents were worried constantly. Every single night they'd wonder, are there new guests? I hope they don't keep us up without music. Just who are these strangers five steps away from my backyard? And instead of being able to wave at a friendly neighbor in the morning or let the neighbor's kids shoot hoops in the backyard, they've now installed security cameras just to get a sense of peace of mind in their own home. This is not what we had expected moving back, and nor is this, this what my parents had imagined ever. Plano's children are growing up, and we're looking to return to the same opportunity that we grew up with. We want for our children what all of you wanted for your children. We want the privilege of allowing them to grow up in a city that's safe, has great schools, a strong seconds. community full of citizens who care and contribute to our great town. We want to live in a neighborhood full of neighbors, not Airbnb listings. Please help stop this cancerous spread of short-term rentals. Cut them out of our residential neighborhoods because I'm very concerned that one day in the future, we'll be here talking about how Plano was the best city in the country. Thank you. Thanks, Benjamin. The next speaker is Alan Samara. Mr. Mayor, Council, great to see you. My name is Alan Samara, and I'm a 16-year resident of Plano. I'm also a former retail chain founder, and we opened our fourth store in 1982 to be near Collin Creek Mall. So I've had a history here in Plano. Uh, most of you know me. I'm a past uh, Planning and Zoning Commissioner, and I want to thank you all for giving me the opportunity to serve our city uh, for two years. Um, having spent time reviewing and assessing the excellent work of the CPRC and our planning staff and our consultant, all of whom worked on the comprehensive plan, um, I had a couple of thoughts when I left, and I wanted to share them with you today. I want to share one with you today, and that was that staff developed a system of looking back at controversial planning decisions that were made during the previous year, and that they report to you not only the statistics of how our city is growing and how much money is being spent, but what happened when we made decisions that were controversial in nature, and how did they, how will they instruct us for treating our city differently in the future? Now, I put up our, our, our land use map, the new land use map, and it's a little hard to read and make some sense out of, but what we've done with the new comprehensive plan is basically hold back the south side of 121, all the available tracks remaining on the tollway, and the Plano Bush Freeway corridor for economic development, for commercial buildings and employment centers. And that has turned out to be a brilliant move, and it has resulted in three dividends that we have had most recently, and it's what motivated me to come here to speak to you tonight. On the 23rd of June, uh, Ryan Companies announced that they were building a 23-story, 400,000-square-foot office building right in the heart of the Legacy Center. 
On the 27th, uh, Prologix, one of the largest industrial developers uh, in our country, um, made a commitment to take over the NTT Dell building that you're all familiar with because of uh, a number of issues we've had to deal with with that building. It's a data center, and they're going to rebuild it as a uh, industrial uh, facility, and it's right on um, Plano Parkway. Um, and, and the last one, and the most important one, the campus at J.C. Penney uh, on, on, uh, on the 17th of May was announced that the J.C. Penney uh, company is coming back to our city to their award-winning, architecturally awarded building. All this happened because we attenuated the building of multifamily on these sites and in these tracks. I urge you to continue to do it. These are three dividends that came about because we held land back for employers. Plano is growing with employers, and we got a good chance to do so in the next 10 years. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Alan. I wanted to, before you go on, Lisa, I just wanted to tell the folks uh, that are here regarding short-term rentals. On September 12th, this, will be, this item will be on the agenda. We will have a representative of uh, Airbnb here. We'll also have a, an attorney that dealt with the Arlington uh, case. So we'll have a lot of good information uh, when we welcome all of you back uh, to speak. But uh, we, we plan on uh, having that on September 12th. So I look forward to seeing you all then. Thank you. The next speaker is Sharon Overall. I would like to thank you for passing the ordinance banning cigarette smoke in parks. It is a good first step, even though I cannot understand why you made trails and parking lots an exception. But this ordinance does not do anything to protect the homeowner. Our homes and yards are our castle, and as we get older, more and more of our world. We need protection from those who blow their chemicals onto our property. We deserve to breathe clean air while we are in our own yards. You are not allowed to consume alcohol on any public street, alley, or sidewalk in the city. So why can you smoke while walking down the sidewalk? You can allow it in an enclosed car, just no dangling the cigarette out of a window and keep the window shut. Anywhere you ban alcohol, you should ban cigarette smoke. Smoking is a practice in which a substance is burned and the resulting smoke is breathed in to be tasted and absorbed into your bloodstream. The combustion of the dried plant leaves vaporizes and delivers active substances into the lungs. These substances are contained in a mixture of aerosol particles and gases. The smoke that is exhaled and breathed in by non-smokers has all the same chemicals and any viruses that attach themselves to the particles and gases while in the lungs and mouth. Exposure to secondhand smoke can be measured by testing saliva, urine, or blood to see if it contains cotinine, which is what is created when the body breaks down the nicotine found in tobacco smoke. Children that are exposed to smokers have high levels of cotinine in their bloodstream. Just some of the dangerous chemicals in secondhand smoke includes vinyl chloride, cadmium, benzene, and arsenic. Byproducts from a tobacco smoke remain in the air and surrounding environment after a cigarette is extinguished. In this way, the effect of smoking on the environment leaves a lasting residue of toxic particles in the environment. Third-hand smoke exposure is exposure to the toxic agents in smoke that have accumulated as residue in clothing, rugs, furniture, dust, toys, etc. The toxic agents can be absorbed through the skin and mucous mem membranes by non-smokers, especially by infants and young children who pick up objects that have the residue and then put their fingers in their mouths. This is why you do not want your neighbor to smoke where the smoke drifts onto your property. Even if you go inside while they are smoking, the residue will be present on any objects where the particles from the smoke land. The Department of Housing and Urban Development prohibits smoking 25 feet from any building Yet a neighbor can smoke on his property and be closer to your house than 25 feet. And if you're sitting out front and a smoker walks seconds. by on the sidewalk, then you're closer than 25 feet from the smoker. So no one should be exposed to harmful chemicals when they're in their own yard by a smoker. 
Secondhand smoke is a nuisance. Thank you. The next speaker is Michael Adler. Hello, Mayor, Council. Thanks for hearing me today. I'm a new resident to Plano. We just moved in three or four months ago, and I was pretty excited about moving in, city of excellence. Uh, unfortunately, uh, the house that we're renting uh, is managed by a landlord that doesn't hold himself to that same standard. I found out during these first few months renting from him that there were many things in disrepair uh, with the home. I was able to use Plano Neighborhood Services to get some of those issues addressed, and I'm very grateful for it, but I also discovered that there is a shortfall with our code for property standards. Um, in speaking with people from Neighborhood Services and some of the council members, I found out that there's no real definition for a working AC unit in a rental home. I just heard that it has to be working. I don't know, does it have to be connected? Does it have to uh, have working ventilation? Does it have to actually make the home cool which is its purpose. There's nothing defined. So as a result of this, there was nothing I can do to force my landlord to make my home habitable. Right now, it's a record high temperature summer, and I have a new child. I have a six-month-old. When I left the hospital, they told me to keep that infant between 70 and 73 degrees. I should be able to do that in my home. Granted, he's not a newborn, he's six months old, but right now, with air conditioning running during the worst part of the day, my home can be 86 to 91 degrees, depending on which room of the house you're in, because it's a long property. If it has to go further from the source, it gets warmer because the insulation is just not there. This is affecting the health of the child. I've uh, taken him to his doctor and a couple other doctors, and they've both told me that I need to address the situation. So I did the best of what I could do because I am more concerned about the health of my child than uh, you know, fighting my landlord about this. I bought an, a mobile AC unit for just the room that we were to stay in. And I tested it out. It got so expensive to run the AC constantly that I turned it off, and I kept my child in the one room of the house where I can keep it cool with a mobile unit. On Smart Meter Texas, I recorded this. You see where that energy use goes down? That's when I turned off the main AC unit. That accounts for, that's for 12 days I ran it without AC and then all these times before and after. That's an average of over 30 kilowatt hours more when running the unit. That's beyond reasonable. Now this is not just about me. That's this situation, that's my problem. But this affects all of us because it puts a strain on our grid. With everybody moving in, you're gonna see more and more instances like we saw last week with the power going out. And the more that happens, the more the federal government can convince Texas to connect our grid to the federal government. I don't think we want that happening. I thank you for your time. Thank you. The last speaker is James Lockridge. Council, Mayor, guys, I'm going to be very blunt and short. Sounds like y'all got a problem, and it ain't the farmers and the ranchers. Miss Mims, you popped off last city council member and said that you were within the means of the state laws, and y'all had did your research. I asked you who you talked to. I asked Jack Carr who you talked to. No one's given me that information. 
Nobody's done anything. But I can tell you the very next day, I talked to state representatives. I talked to a senator. I talked to the Farm Bureau. I talked to everybody you could imagine, 30 something people. None of them said anything. Not only did that happen, Jack Carr got phone calls from state representatives' offices, okay, saying that this law is not acceptable. It's a step in the right direction, but it is not acceptable. So I'm gonna ask you right here in front of everybody in this city council, who did you talk to? Who told you that it was acceptable? Because I haven't found anybody. Now, I'm tired of getting the runaround. I have asked the city of Plano to meet and step up and do the right thing, to visit with their state reps. You haven't done it, not one time. Shelby Williams, thank you for the uh, phone call. Thank you for checking into it. I have some paperwork for you. Ms. Homer, thank you as well. I appreciate that. I appreciate you two city council members stepping up to do and try to find out what is the right source. Now, I've told you, if your officers are gonna go rogue on farming and ranching, they better do it to everybody in the city because farming and ranching, we're tired. We're tired of getting pushed around. We're tired of getting our property rights acts taken away from us. We have the right to be here. We were here long before the cities ever came to Texas. Texas was built on farming and ranching, not on lies. Texas was built on the people's backbones and the hard work that they created for the state of Texas to be able to live free, to farm, to ranch, to use their land the way they want. I'm simply just asking for it to happen. Mark, what is the issue with having a meeting? We had one yet, Mr. Mr. Mums. Mr. We Lockridge. haven't had a meeting yet at all Mr. since Lockridge. this last time. Mr. Lockridge, we have had a meeting. One. And, and in fact, Mr. Carr and I are preparing a letter to meet with you at your property. As soon as that letter's finished, it should be within the next two weeks for us to meet with you at, your, at whatever property you choose so that we can discuss that letter. I think the letter that you've referred to a number of times is dated April 22nd, 2022. That came from the state. That's one of them. Okay. We're still looking for that other letter that you have just so that we can, when we're responding, that we can fully respond. So if you're able to produce that for us, that will help us make sure that as we're having that meeting, it's as productive as we can possibly make it. But we're, as soon as we get that, we're happy to schedule that meeting. Both Mr. Carr and I will be at whatever property you want to be let's, able to discuss Let's that. do it tomorrow. I'll we need, that, we need that letter first, sir, to be able to review okay, it and I make believe, sure that- I believe a state rep office has already sent it to Jack Carr, but I have it right here, so I'll be happy to give it to you. That would be fantastic. If you can give a, a copy to, to Andrew, we'll be happy to take a picture of it, and we can uh, try to get that scheduled sometime this week. Mayor and City Council, we got an outside legal opinion from Vincent and Elkins Law Firm. They helped us in the water case, and it was their Austin office who specializes and regulatory compliance issues. Uh, that opinion, like all legal advice, is confidential, but there is also an AG opinion that supports um, that we are within our right to enforce uh, that state statute, and we can, uh, Mark, send that to you, that you can get that to Mr. Lockridge. So uh, that's all I'm asking for, meetings. Let's get to the bottom of it. Let's get it right. The only one out of all the cities in the state of a Texas that has literally come to the table to try to accept agricultural and ranching is the city of McKinney, where their law has now changed to where you farm up to edge of row crop or up to edge of crop, meaning you plow and plant it or it's native prairie grass or it's coastal or it's Johnson grass. If a farmer says it's ag, it's ag. So. I'm asking you to, to look into these ordinances and try to make this correct for all farming and ranching. Thank you. Thank you very much. Is that it? Let's move on to the consent agenda. The consent agenda. The consent agenda will be acted upon in one motion and contains items which are routine and typically non-controversial. Items may be removed from this agenda for individual discussion by a council member, the city manager, or any citizen. The presiding officer will establish time limits based upon the number of speaker requests. Motion to approve the consent agenda as presented. Second. Thank you. I have a motion and a second. Uh, to approve the consent agenda. 
Please vote. Motion passes eight to zero. Thank you. Next item. <clears throat> Public hearing items. Applicants are limited to 15 minutes presentation time with a five-minute rebuttal if needed. Remaining speakers are limited to 30 total minutes of testimony time with three minutes assigned per speaker. The presiding officer may amend these times as deemed necessary. Non-public hearing items. The presiding officer will permit public comment for items on the agenda not posted for a public hearing. The presiding officer will establish time limits based upon the number of speaker requests, the length of the agenda, and to ensure meeting efficiency, and may include a cumulative time limit. Speakers will be called in the order the requests are received until the cumulative time is exhausted. Item number one, public hearing and consideration of an ordinance as requested in zoning case 2022-10 to amend Article 4 amendments of the Comprehensive Zoning Ordinance of the City Ordinance number 2015-5-2 as heretofore amended, pertaining to noticing requirements for zoning text, zoning ordinance text amendments and providing a penalty clause, a repealer clause, a savings clause, a severability clause, a publication clause, and an effective date. Good evening, Mayor, Council, Executives. Uh, this I'm Christina Day, Director of Planning, and I'm here to present Zoning Case 2022-10. It is a text amendment uh, related to a recent legal case. Um, it is to reaffirm our existing notice requirements that have been longstanding and uh, regarding our public notices to ensure they are continue to be compliant with state law. So the details of this, um, Again, there was legal advice on this recent court case. It was the city of Austin versus Francisca Acuna. Um, those were, uh, that was given to the city council on June 13th and the planning and zoning commission on June 20th. Then there was a call for public hearing that was made uh, by the planning and zoning commission on that same night, June 20th. So notice requirements for changes to the text of the zoning ordinance date back to 1971. So they've been going on for uh, the similar way for quite some time. Um, the state law uh, does state very explicitly that um, notice for time and place of hearing is published in an official newspaper at least 15 days before the hearing. Then we kind of up our game, as um, we like to do in Plano, by saying, no, 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 we're going to do 20 days prior to the hearing date. <laughs> so what the, this legal case has stated is that changes to the text ordinance of the amendment may be subject to individual notices to property owners. So the state law also does provide for adopting an alternative notice procedure within the law. And so we need to be very clear that that newspaper notice is our alternative notice procedure. So we've, we've looked at our ordinance language and made some proposals uh, to make sure that it's crystal clear that that is our alternative procedure. So we're making some very minor text amendments that are proposed to ensure that clarity that it's not going to exceed, but it will meet the minimum state law requirements and notwithstanding the requirements of the state that any amendment um, will, that relates to change of zoning regulation or general text amendment of the ordinance will be given in the newspaper. So the scope Again, we'll add language to reaffirm our existing notice practices. It also creates efficiency because it would essentially be changing our notice practice if we um, choose not to reaffirm this. We want to go forward with a legal um, letter notices. If we want to start mailing those, we estimate that would be approximately $400,000 in hard cost and then additional staff time. Those are both unbudgeted items. So that's the kind of alternate route if we want to be on the safe side legally. And so the effect of the proposed amendment is a continuation of our current practices and really no change. 
So with that, um, we did an analysis of the comprehensive plan, uh, looked at the guiding principles of Plano Today, Plano 2050, Plano Together, that our land use action talks about evaluating the zoning ordinance and making appropriate amendments based on guidance in the comprehensive plan, really seeking community involvement and participation. It will proactively seek civic participation and engage with the public in regular communication and provide significant, uh, sufficient information regarding policies, programs, and decision making um, using both traditional outreach methods and social media. So although we are not proposing the to send citywide letters, we wanted to remind everyone that there are a number of other means that people have to get information on zoning, such as our active uh, petitions, zoning petitions website that has a lot of, of very detailed information on upcoming zoning cases and the zoning case alert email system. And this one I actually pulled out of my email inbox the notice for this case, a text amendment. So you can see how that works. And even if you're not, you just isolate to a single zip code you will get text amendments for the city. So I think that is a fairly easy way to get information. So this is the recommendation of the Planning and Zoning Commission. It was a unanimous recommendation from PNZ, and I'm available for questions you might have on this item. Thank you, Christina. Any questions for Christina? Thank you. I'll open the public hearing. There are no speakers no on this speakers. item. Seeing that there are no speakers, I'll close the public hearing, confine the comments to the council. Motion to approve. Second the motion. I have a motion and a second to approve agenda item number one. Any comments? Please vote. <clears throat> Motion passes eight to zero. Thank you. Next item. Item number two, <clears throat> public hearing and consideration of a resolution to approve the use or taking of a portion of City of Plano public parkland known as Oak Point Recreation Center pursuant to chapter 26 of the Texas Parks and Wildlife Code to approve the using of a portion of dedicated parkland as a permanent utility easement for the purpose of sanitary sewer improvements located at 600 Jupiter Road, authorizing the city manager or his designee to execute all necessary documents and providing an effective date. Good evening, Council and Mayor Munns. My name is Ron Smith. I'm your Parks and Recreation Director. We have a request from the city's engineering department for a water utility easement at Oak Point Park. The project is located near the intersection of Jupiter Road and Spring Creek Parkway near the Oak Point Recreation Center. This easement is in support of the development of the Plano Event Center parcel. Oak Point Park is city of Plano public park land and as such, chapter 26 of the Texas Parks and Wildlife Code requires a public hearing. Two things that council will need to find during the course of this public hearing, number one, that there is no feasible and prudent alternative to the, to the use or taking of a portion of the public mm -hmm. park. And number two, that the project includes all reasonable planning to minimize harm to the public park space. Staff has reviewed this project and we do believe that it complies with these two requirements. The project was reviewed by the Parks and Recreation Planning Board in June of this year and they concur with staff's assessment since the city of Plano is the applicant, Matt Yeager, the city's real estate manager, will present the case for the hearing. And I'll be glad to answer any questions from a Parks and Recreation perspective. Good evening, Council Mayor. My name is Matthew Yeager. I am the city's real estate manager. Ron gave an excellent introduction here. Um, the Oak Point Recreation Center is located at the southeast corner of Jupiter and Spring Creek Parkway. It was built in the year of 2000 and recently renovated in 2017. Um, and as Ron mentioned, 
it's in, this project is in support of the development of the Plano Event Center to the west across Jupiter Road. Uh, the actual easement being requested by the engineering department for this project is 30 feet wide and approximately 270 feet extending from Jupiter onto the north lawn of the Oak Point Recreation Center. Uh, here you can see photos of the alignment, uh, one looking east from Jupiter Road right of way. Uh, the second on the right there is looking from the terminus of the easement where there's an existing manhole that serves for sewer infrastructure on the property. Ron's already addressed the two requirements before granting any easement or taking of public parkland. Uh, first is that we demonstrate that there has been no feasible or prudent alternative to this alignment. Uh, the second being that the engineering department working with our parks and recreation staff um, has done all reasonable planning to minimize harm that could come about to the property from the infrastructure. Towards the first requirement of having uh, no feasible and prudent alternative, I'd ask that you take a look at the photo in front of you. Um, it looks quite like a multicolored rainbow of bowl of spaghetti. Um, all of those are subsurface utilities that exist at the intersection of Spring and Creek Parkway and Jupiter Road. Um, seeing all of these particular conflicts, our engineering department in consultation with our hired consultants determined the best course of action is the pink uh, alignment that you see before you uh, that will be bored across Jupiter Road and then once crossing about 30 feet into uh, the Oak Point Recreation Center property open cut uh, to the terminus where you will see that red line on the far right of the photo that heads northwards towards the Oak Point Park and Nature Preserve. Um, there was one feasible, not feasible, but not particularly prudent alternative that was vetted that would have crossed uh, the property diagonally, uh, caused for a second route across Spring Creek Parkway and involved the taking of trees and other uh, more natural uh, or nature at the Oak Point Park and Nature Preserve that lies to the north of the actual recreation center. The second requirement is all reasonable planning to minimize harm. Uh, being a subsurface easement, uh, this, the primary conflict will be during construction when the uh, lawn it will be opened up so that the line can be put underneath the ground. Uh, upon having it installed, the surface will be restored to its prior condition. Uh, the only real uh, harm coming from this is actually going to occur within the right-of-way where there are two hackberry trees that are slated to be removed. Uh, but the turf and the lawn will be restored to the point where uh, the average park user, the average recreation patron, will not be able to tell the difference that it was there. Um, also, during the installation of the sewer line, it's well north of all activities that occur at Oak Point Recreation Center, so while it might be unsightly, um, it will be uh, quickly addressed and will not interfere with any activities on the actual parcel itself. So uh, given that that is the case, uh, tonight we're here to ask that you uh, approve the resolution before you. Thank you. Any questions for staff? Uh, not a question. I was going to make a motion. Oh, okay. No, I got to open. You are. Good for you, though, Anthony. <laughs> <laughs> it's a, a very proud moment. <laughs> Council, Councilman Grady? Um, just one quick question. I, I understand that the turf is all going to be put back at the end of the project, so you really won't be able to tell that there was anything there other than maybe the turf is a little bit of a different color at the time. It indicated also that it was going across the roadway, and the roadway was just resurfaced not too long ago. Is it going to be... Um, uh, run underneath the, the roadway, or are you going to have to remove the roadway and, repl and replace it? It will be bored underneath the roadway, so there won't involve any cutting or opening up of Jupiter Road. Perfect. Thank you very much. Okay, there we go. If, if... There are no speakers on this item. All right. All right. Here we go. Well, I just wanted to, to compliment uh, Manager Yeager and Director Smith. This was really thorough and showed a great level of thought about how to do this in the best way possible. So I move to approve. Perfect. Second the motion. <laughs> I have a motion and a second uh, to approve agenda item number two. 
Any comments? Please vote. Thank you. Motion passes eight to zero. Next item. Item number three, public hearing on the fiscal year 2022-23 recommended budget and the fiscal year 2022 proposed community investment program. Good evening, Karen Rhodes Whitley, budget director for the city of Plano. Uh, we have four different agenda items we're gonna go through with y'all. This one is the public hearing on the recommended budget, which totals $677 million, and the proposed capital improvement program, which totals $330 million. And this is the public hearing. Oh. Open it, huh? Okay, well that was, I will open the public hearing. I have one speaker. All right. Cecil Red. Gee, I feel privileged. It's, it's just me. Uh, good evening. I'm Cecil Red. I have lived in Plano since 1998, and I'm a tennis player. Any other tennis players here? Mere months, I think you play at uh, at Grand Eagles. Anybody, anybody else? It's been a while. It's been a while. Raise your hand. <laughs> By three of us, how about that? Well, great. Do you want to ask about pickleball? <laughs> no. <laughs> Actually, I, don't, I, haven't, I haven't done that yet. Okay. The, uh, I'm here to request that included in the city budget under the Parks and Recreation Department, a contingency for $25,000 to evaluate and then install misting fans on the changeover benches at High Point Tennis Center. Uh, those of you that don't play tennis or if you just never seen it on TV, you know, after every other game or so, they sit down. Well, that's what we're talking about. At High Point, there is an awning, and then I'll have a bench on either side. Well, it's been really hot, and it's been hot for a long time, and it seems to be getting hotter. And I think we're just headed towards some kind of terrible health catastrophe somewhere. And I was thinking that it might be really nice to have these misting fans. About a month ago, the uh, excellent on-site staff at High Point requested uh, uh, Parks and Recreation to take a look and see what they can do. The uh, response was cavalier at best. Uh, nobody came out. They just came back and said, no, we don't have the money for that. And they didn't even uh, take the time to figure out what would have to be done and how much it might cost. Uh, I just took a, I washed my car over at the car wash just, uh, just north of Plano Parkway, and they installed some misting fans for their staff. They had a, uh, a bid for $17,000 for 16 misting fans. At High Point, there are 20 courts, 21 courts, and then 10 stations where this might go, where the awnings are on the changeover. So that would be about 20 of these fans. So I figured 25,000 ought to get it. This is including installation, not just buying the fans, but including installation. Uh, McKinney, Frisco, and even Anna have uh, either indoor courts or covered courts. And here at Plano, uh, even Glen Eagles doesn't have covered courts. I mean, doesn't have these misters. So <laughs> I... I think we could step up, you know, keep this a nice place to live, maybe keep somebody from having a heat injury. 20 seconds. I'm sorry. I, that's it. Uh, let's see. That, that's about it. I have any questions? Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Okay. Well, thank you all. You bet. And Karen. Okay, this is, oh, I'm sorry. Do you want to read it? I, I'll read it for you. Okay. Consideration of a resolution to accept the certified appraisal role for fiscal year 2022-23 for Collin County and providing an effective date. Okay, I have some very exciting slides to show you here in a minute. <laughs> but let's talk real quick about the appraisal role. 
Right now, you have Collin County, which is certified. Denton County still has not certified. So the numbers I'm going to show you tonight are the same ones that you saw July 27th. Supposedly, they're supposed to be certified towards the end of August, so hopefully you'll be able to have that certification at the next city council meeting. Um, real quick, this is a look at where we stand today uh, with Collins certified, and of course we're waiting on Denton, but you're at 51.9 billion for your taxable value. You still have new property coming in at 573 million. Your total roll is going to increase or change in value 4.2 billion, and your change in your base is 3.7 billion dollars. This is another way of looking at it, 51.9 billion in assessed property values. Your change in taxable, 3.7 versus your new growth. Uh, let's talk about this. I know there's been some questions. Our market value for our home increased practically 25%. The main reason that your change is going on is because of the existing property values residentially are going up versus your commercial property. Look back, 2021, 53% of your roll was coming in from the commercial growth, uh, commercial values, and it was 47% on residential. That is starting to shift. 51% is coming in from commercial and 49% for residential. So basically, even though you have most of your new growth is going on on commercial, the commercial is basically stabilized over the last couple of years. Last year, it actually went down uh, with the residential property values going up. Another way to look at this, 573 million is your new growth. Out of that new growth, 12%, grew on residential, commercial accounted for 88% of that growth. You'll see what happened last year. Now let's go down to the bottom. 3.7 billion in existing property values are going up. Out of that 3.7, 68% of that is on your residential side with 32% on your commercial side. Now, look at last year. Last year, your resident property values went up 181% over what they had done in the year before, but your commercial values had declined. So are there any questions? That's what's going on with the property tax roll. Okay, this is just a look. Overall, property tax revenues are coming in at $221 million. Uh, half of that is going for residential, 39% is going for your commercial, and 11.6% is going for multifamily. Within the document, we have that your revenues are increasing in the general fund and geodet by $211 million. The difference between that $221 and 211 is because we owe into TIFs, and we also take off the savings for the over 65 tax freeze. Comes out of that, so that's the difference on that. Okay, now let's talk about some good news here. When the chief appraisers come out with their role, they give us what the average market value is. The average market value on a home. This year is 493960 Out of all that, we have total exemptions on both residential and commercial that totals $12.5 billion that comes off your roll, which produces annual savings of $53 million, and then the over 65 or 65 and over exemption accounts for savings of $6.1 million. This is the slide that we showed y'all a couple of weeks back. This is based on the market value of the home. Last Friday, I was filling out the paperwork I'm about to show you that needs to be filled out. In looking at the boxes, it says to show the average homesteaded value. When you go and do this, I called up Bo Deaf and himself, 
Last year's average homesteaded value was 315,000. This year, it's 338. What is already built into these numbers is the 20%, in addition, the 10% cap, because homeowners will only pay on their taxable value up to the 10%. So all this is built into these numbers. Originally, we had another slide in here that showed, hey, last year our average value was 396. If it's only allowed to grow 10%, and we had a whole nother slide, and it showed the total increase would be $72. When you use these amounts, and these are the amounts that are going to go into the newspaper this next week, the average increase on a homesteaded property is $36 at the 42.65 cents. Now, this is a lot better than $268. Now, that's the recommended rate. Let's go, if you go down to the no new revenue rate, which by the way, came in at 41.76 cents, it shows an increase of $6. Any thoughts on these slides? I just think it's a lot better news. <laughs> Much better news. No kidding. <laughs> yes, Mr. Williams. <laughs> Uh, thank you for these updated slides, Karen, that uh, eased welcome. my heart palpitations. Um, <laughs> um, I am uh, I'm inferring that the slightly increased uh, tax bill with the no new revenue rate is because the residential property values have increased um, more than commercial property values. That is correct. Okay. That is so. definitely correct. So it doesn't matter, and I'm sure y'all been reading the newspapers uh, and other information from the other cities. We're all coming out with the same information. Because the housing values have increased, even if you go with the no new revenue rate, they will see a small increase in their property tax bill. Because it's an aggregate calculation across the that entire city. That is correct. We don't have separated out commercial uh, property taxes versus residential. Thank you. Okay, so that's our good news. We're going to go to item number five. Oh, I am so sorry. Okay, yes, you are going to vote on this, but just remember this is your Collin County side, not Denton. And we will bring back the Denton. Go ahead. So how will these numbers that you told us potentially change with getting the Denton numbers, or will they not change that much since we have such a small percentage I of I am Denton? so sorry. I'm going hard of hearing. Can you? Yeah. Okay. So Karen and I have had this discussion about the impact of Denton County on oh, these numbers. That's the impact. Okay. Yes, we have an estimated role from them. Nothing, they only have, you have 92, over 92,000 properties uh, on the Collins side. You only have 2,000 on the Denton side. And out of that, you only have, only 1.4 billion is the Denton versus your 50 something over here in the calling. So when we get it, it is gonna change your numbers a little bit, but it's not gonna be that drastic. It's just not. Okay. So, okay. So what we need is a motion for the adoption of the resolution. Right. Just, the just I shall make that motion. Quite frankly, just the Collin County tax rate. Yeah. 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 I shall make that motion. I'll second. Thank you. I'll second. I have a motion, a second to uh, approve a, item three, four. We were, is, we, okay. Now it's four. Okay. The resolution to accept certified appraisal roll. All in favor, please vote. All opposed, please vote. <clears throat> okay, motion passes eight to zero to um, accept the certified appraisal roll. Next item, five. Discussion and direction regarding proposed ad valorem tax rate. 
Okay, tonight is the night where y'all will decide on, we're about to have a form that will be going into the paper. It will announce what your no new revenue rate is, your voter approval rate, and then your recommended rate. You cannot go up from the rate y'all decide tonight, but you can go down. We'll get to that in a minute. Um, Texas property tax laws, truth in taxations, what it's known by. Property owners have the right to know about their increases in their property's appraised values and to be notified of estimated taxes that could result in the new value. A ta taxing unit must publish its no new revenue rate, I mean, no new tax rate and voter approval rate before adopting an actual tax rate, and that's what we're going to do this next week. A taxing unit must publish special notices and hold one public hearing before adopting a tax rate that exceeds the lower the no new revenue rate or the voter approval tax rate. And a taxing unit is required to hold an election if you approve a tax rate that goes over the voter approval tax rate. The no new revenue tax rate is calculated rate that would provide a taxing unit the same amount of revenues it received in the year before on properties tax in both years. If properties rise, the no new revenue rate will go down and vice versa. The resulting tax rate shows a relationship between last year's revenue and current year's property appraisals. Your no new revenue rate, and this is certified, came in at 41.76 cents. This is a seesaw effect. When your appraised property values go up, your NNR goes down. Say if next year our appraised property values start going down, our no new revenue rate will go up. Your voter approval rate, formerly called the rollback tax rate, is the calculated maximum tax rate allowed by law without voter approval. The voter approval rate provides cities with the same amount of tax revenue spent in the previous year for day-to-day -day operations, plus you add on 3.5% for operations. You must have an election if a, your adopted tax rate exceeds the voter approval tax rate. Your voter approval tax rate came in at 43.77 cents. Our tax rate has two different parts. You have your dirt debt service part. Debt has to be paid first. So whenever you're calculating the rate, we always go to debt first. Get that completely paid. Anything else can fund your operations. This is the way we are looking, or this is the way you looked back in the city manager recommended budget that was produced on July 27th. The operating maintenance rate is 31.15 cents. Okay, that's down by 2.15 cents from last year's or the current year's rate of 33.30. If you decide to go down to the no new revenue rate, we've already got the debt rate is secure. It's at 11.5, okay? We would take money out of the operating part of the general fund in order to get down to 30.26 cents on the general fund side. So right now, you're at 42.65 cents we would need to go in and remove about $4 million out of the operating budget in order to get down to the no new revenue rate. Once again, here's a look at all what I just said, 41.76 cents, your no new revenue rate, 43.77 cents is the voter approval rate. The proposed rate is 42.65 cents, and we would need about $4.5 million to reduce it. Okay, this is just a chart showing the difference over the last several years on where the no new revenue rate or effective tax rate was compared to the actual tax rate. Yes, sir. Oh, I'm sorry. I was just scratching my head. Sorry. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I want to remind especially the viewing public, we offer a 20% homestead exemption. This year alone, 
That is $422 in savings. On your roll, we have about 75,000 residential customers. Only 50 have the homestead exemption. Out of that 50, you have 18,000 that have the tax freeze. This year alone, that tax freeze is $332 savings. So see, that's a lot of savings when you go in and you have your homesteaded property. Okay, let's talk about what we're gonna do tonight. Tonight, you will be discussing what your tax rate ceiling's going to be. Whether it's the 42.65 that Mark has included in his recommended budget, if it's the, a lot of cities will go in and do the voter approval rate, just knowing that they can come down. Whatever you decide, you can't go up, but you can go down. Now let me show you the form. Oh, and we also need to announce when you want the public hearing. If you decide to go down to the no new revenue rate, uh, you don't have to have a public hearing, but most of the time we have one anyway. So, but we like to announce when the date's gonna be and it's on the form. Now, this is the form that you can barely see. I just want you to notice at that top. This is the form that is filled out right now because we're at the 42.65 cents. If y'all decide we're going to do the no new revenue rate, it's a different form. And on that form, instead of notice of public hearing on tax increase, it says notice of meeting to vote on tax rate. So you have two different forms here. Now, all the forms will be, you'll take a record vote, whoever votes for it, against it, or abstains, all your names are gonna be written on this form. It does go into the Dallas Morning News. Now, no matter which form we use, this is the uh, bottom portion of the form. The total tax rate right now what it was last year and what it was this year. And this is how we started figuring out we could use that average homestead of taxable value. It's clearly written on the state comptroller's forms that that's the rate we're supposed to be using. So that's where I came up with the 315,330, uh, going up to 338,499. You go in and average out the tax, it's an increase of $36. What questions do you have? You're looking at me like, uh-oh. <laughs> Council member Riccadelli. <clears throat> you were first. <laughs> I, I, guess, I guess so. <laughs> if, if you wanna go first, that's, that's you. Me. A, 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 after I you, will. after you, Council member Grady. Um, I believe in, in and, and the members of the council and, and certainly can correct me and you can correct me as well. I believe that we still have discussions to be had on the budget. Um, we have a discussion, I believe, on this Wednesday or this Saturday. Mm -hmm. um, we will have another discussion after that when we come to a conclusion. I think during those discussions, we might have um, uh, some decisions to be made on the budget uh, and that may... Um, that may make, our, make us change our mind as to what the tax rate should be. So I think to be as flexible as possible during this process as we're still having this discussion, I would recommend that we have the, uh, the recommended rate of, of 0.4265 so that we have the flexibility to make those decisions as we have our discussions. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I'll start by saying I, I'm also uh, fine with publishing the, the city manager's recommended rate of, of 42.65 and preserving flexibility for uh, our, our continuing discussions, especially the workshop on Saturday. I did have uh, a question uh, for you, Karen, and, and thank you for all of the information you've been providing. It's been, been very helpful. You're welcome. Um, if you could remind me, in the re-estimate of sales tax revenue, we're using uh, 10 months of actuals, and then we've got two months uh, where we're using the budgeted amount to fill in because those months haven't happened yet. Is that correct? Yes, that is correct. And just for y'all's information, on Saturday, I will be giving a full discussion regarding sales tax. But your sales tax, we have, of course, the three-year cap. That's a city council policy. So when we go to budget our sales tax, 
our three year annual projection was $87 million. Year to date, through now, plus I've added on a 5% increase for the last two months, you end up at $104 million. That is included within the recommended re-estimate. Mm -hmm. So that revenue, just like property tax revenue, just like building and development related revenue, that has gone to fund our re-estimated expenditures and next year's budgeted expenditures. Now mm -hmm. on the, for the 22-23, we're using the three-year cap, but we have an added an inflationary factor onto that because if we were to do the three-year, it would go down to $95 million and we didn't think that was realistic. Mm -hmm. so, well, and, yes. and, and thank, thank you for that, Karen. I, I agree, you know, in, in inflation has, you know, has changed uh, things such that comparisons to two or three years ago are not apples to apples anymore, given the, the, yeah. the high inflation environment that we're in. So I, I think that was a prudent policy. I was just going to, I, I guess, since uh, uh, Council Member Grady went ahead and make comments, I'll consolidate my comments with that question, or I can wait to make comments until yeah, everyone has okay. asked questions. Okay, perfect. <clears throat> so I, I just want to say, I think that uh, in reviewing this, this is already a fiscally responsible budget, and I want to express my appreciation to City Manager Israelson, uh, uh, Director Rhodes Whitley, the whole budget and research team, and the whole city organization for that. Um, I also would point out that we've had $18 million uh, in ARPA funds this year. Uh, we, we've got in the re-estimate a $17.3 million sales tax surplus, which we've already budgeted, uh, but just uh, as, as we have the ARPA funds as well, of course, on, on public safety salaries. We may uh, also have uh, funds coming to us from DART, uh, and uh, we may have a further sales tax surplus if trends continue and the, the, the remaining two months of the year are even higher than the 5% that, that's built in as the, as the preceding 10 months have been. Uh, and so uh, I think that provides us an opportunity to provide some additional relief to Plano residents in a difficult economic time, very likely while still doing all of the projects in the proposed budget. Uh, so especially given that increases in valuations on existing properties have hit residential homeowners much harder than commercial properties over the past couple of years just because of the way that the market has gone and, and how that's driven appraisals, uh, that's something that I would uh, favor doing uh, by getting down to the no new revenue rate. Obviously, I'm fine uh, noticing the, um, you know, the, the city manager's recommended rate, um, but I think that, that as our discussions continue, uh, you know, that's, that's something I would, I would advocate uh, uh, moving towards. Okay. Councilman Smith, and I'll just have uh, Councilmember Homer and then Councilmember Williams will just come back, come back this way. So uh, thank you, Mayor. The, floor um, is yours. the one thing that's, I think that we're, we may be forgetting about, and, and, and I think it's worth mentioning is that a lot of us know that we're running right now at about over 9% inflation rate. It, I mean, it varies a little bit, but it's, it's going mm -hmm. up there. When I first saw these numbers, I had to look at it again. I said, but this can't be right. You know, we're overall, we're, we're going to have, we're asking for about a 4% you know, increase. We're doing the primary responsibility that we as a governmental entity and city do is provide for public safety the best that we can do. We're adding what, 2023, 20, we're recommending 23 mm -hmm. public new safety. public safety personnel. And, and we're still coming in at a rate of increase, if, if this is the way it ends up, at less than half of what the rate of inflation has been. And I know we've, we've had costs you know, increase just like everybody else. So uh, again, I, I really want to commend Mark and the staff and, and, and your folks for all the department heads for coming together and bringing us a starting point that is, I think is better than we could have asked for. Uh, so I, like everybody else, I said, I'm more than happy to support publishing the city manager's recommended rate, but I know we have discussions coming, as Councilman Grady said, and, and I would challenge Mark and Karen to give us ideas. I mean, if you see if there's any feasible way, as Karen said, we can't go up, we can always come down, that we can lower that rate, I'm with you on it. So just do the good work that you do for us, and we'll get some more ideas on Saturday and move forward from there. So thanks again for giving us this great starting point. It makes our job a lot easier. Very good. Uh, I agree with what Council um, Member 
Grady and Smith both said, I know we can, we can come down, but we can't go up. Um, 20 or $36 for an average household of an increase to me seems pretty reasonable. You said we'd have to find a place to cut $4 million if we went down. Is that correct? The, if, if you will lean that way, we will come back. We, Mark's <clears throat> already discussed it with them, with engineering and public works and parks and rec. We will go back into the capital maintenance fund and they're already working on it. Some of the projects we can delay to other years. And right now we have $37 million coming in from the general fund. We would go down to $33 million coming in from the general fund. The capital maintenance fund, as long as we keep $20 million in that fund balance to us, that is our fund balance policy, we will be good to go. Mark, did you want to add anything to that? Mayor and Council, I the recommendation uh, of the budget was we've, we've gone through our programs and services. We've gone through our departments and had a number of discussions. And as I've shared with each of you when we laid this out, our budget is a little different in Plano than most cities in that we balance not only our personnel, but also our financial policies, our programs and services, our infrastructure, as well as affordability each and every year. My concern is, is that when you've asked me to balance those, that we're, we're weighting each and every one of those with equal value. Because when we talk about the city of excellence, it comes down to those programs and services. It comes down to our people. It comes down to maintaining those financial policies so we do have a AAA bond rating. It's making sure we take care of that infrastructure and don't let it degrade to a point where it costs us more in the future than it does today. And then finally, it also always matters about the affordability and the value, which is not only the revenue that it costs, but the corresponding programs and services that goes with that. That really is the value of the city of Plano as compared to all of our neighboring cities. If you look at Dallas, which is close to 77 cents, if you look at Fort Worth at 71 cents, if you look at you know, Arlington, which is over 60 cents, and you look at Irving, which is close to 60 cents, if you look at every other city in Collin County of size, we have the lowest rate. Of those big cities, we are the lowest rate. And if you look at our services, I would compare them to any city favorably. So that I don't think there's a discussion about the value proposition of the city of Plano. But my biggest concern is pushing projects out sends a message that some projects aren't going to get done. And I think that's something we need to take very seriously because being proactive about our infrastructure and our policies and our people and everything else has been a hallmark of the city of excellence. So I would just caution the, the council. The recommendation is the recommendation. Can we do it? Yes, we can. The council has to decide if we do it. Um, in a meeting we had not too long ago, you gave a great um, comparison that in the city of Plano that we pay about the average household, I think you gave me the number of $1,400 a year for fire, for safety, for water services. I mean, all, oh, okay, 1400 oh, I see it, okay. So, um, I mean, that's less than a lot of people pay for their HOA dues, so I think it's really impressive that the city's done such a great job keeping our, our tax rate low and our services exceptional. So I would be in favor of doing what um, Mr. Grady said and, and going ahead with the the higher rate just so we have some room during our discussion um, on Saturday if other things come up that maybe we hadn't talked about. We can always go down. Thank you. A uh, couple quick things I want to echo. I'm good with publishing the recommended rate. Uh, I would like to try to achieve the no new revenue rate, but um, I don't think it can be overstated uh, just how much credit um, you all are due, Karen, Mark, Denise, all the staff, because uh, as Councilman Riccadelli said, this is a very fiscally responsible uh, budget, and as Councilman Smith indicated, doubly so given the most recent rating of 9.1% year-over-year year infl year inflation. Um, that is an incredibly fiscally responsible budget, and um, again, I don't think that can be overstated, so you have all done fantastic work on this. Um, <clears throat> were it any other year than in this inflationary environment, well, or the past two of the pandemic, so with some additional caveats, um, I would have no problem passing this. But uh, because of the current inflation, because our people are um, 
seeing increased uh, costs everywhere, I do want to try to achieve the no new revenue rate. I fully understand the trade-offs involved, um, and I can only hope that this inflationary environment does not uh, persist for too long. So I also would uh, support <clears throat> the recommended rate. So, um, that's not an issue with me. Um, it is an issue with me when we are looking at um, possibly cutting $4 million from the projects that we currently have in the works. Um, not that skimping and stingy and penny pinching is not a good idea, but what that does to our future in City of Plano, I think that's where my problem is. Um, does the saving of that $4 million today, is that going to increase our burden next year to our residents next year or the year after that? Will that um, increase the cost and the labor that may have to go into making up that $4 million that we are saving this time around? And, and I, I think we have to sort of keep that in perspective, that we are not really, at this point, we're not comparing ourselves to the other big cities and the reason why we are able to come with the recommended tax rates because we've done so well in Plano for the many years of keeping up um, with all the amenities, keeping up maintenance of services in, in, our, um, in our facilities so that we're able to cut our budget to the point where we are pretty much at skin and bones. Am, am I correct about that, Karen? That is correct. So, and you definitely are correct that, you know, this happened to us back in the economic uh, downturn. We decided to uh, forego several capital improvement projects and terrible decision at that time. The reason why is because we waited a couple of years and the price just skyrocketed. So you're, you're correct. That's a correct assumption. If you put off things till tomorrow, we have no idea what the inflation cost is going to be or the cost of the, the construction material, lumber, exactly. and concrete. And We're already having problems with supply chain. We're dealing so. with 9.1% inflation mm -hmm. rate. And who is to tell us that next year is going to be better? So basically what we're saying to this $4 million projects is that it might not happen if we cut it. And it, even if we are planning on doing it, we may have to borrow money in order to complete it. And, and that's not something that Plano wants to do. So I think those are all the um, added considerations that I have in supporting the current recommended rate and to really look out for our future and for our, you know, for our, for our future and for our kids' future, that we want to make sure that, you know, we're going to have to keep the stability of Plano and the consistency of Plano, um, you know, without just because we're trying to pinch that little more this year to make us look better. Um, you know, it, it may end up that we will look worse next year, and, and I, I don't want to pass that burden on. Mayor Pro Tem. Thanks so much for you and your team's hard work. You always do a great job. Um, like all of my council members have said, I'm fine with posting the city manager's recommended rate. Um, I did mention last time that I have concerns about the amount of costs that we're going to pass on to the average resident. I I'm glad that it came down to $36, yeah. but you know, the difference between 36 and six, mm -hmm. you know, it, it may not sound a lot like a lot, but $30 to a single mom or someone on a, a fixed income is, you know, still $30. So I'm sensitive to that. And um, I would like us to have a discussion about it on Saturday and see if we can if we can get there. I think that based on the amount you showed us in the capital maintenance fund of where we are currently and the amount that's projected to come in sales tax, if we take those items out, I feel like there's a potential for us to get them done another way. And also, um, to the points of uh, supply chain issues and inflation, we don't know what next year is going to look like, but there's an opportunity that some of those issues get resolved and we could have some cost savings if in the future if some of those things 
come down a little bit. So um, I think they're all discussions for us to have, and so I'd like to have those on Saturday. Yes, and I, I do want to say something about the inflation. And uh, we have it all separated, braided out in the budget. And the reason why we did that, we added in to the department and we kept it stockpiled. They're not allowed to use that for anything else. It's to go for the services that they told us X contracts going up by X, Y, Z. That way, you know, in the future when it comes down, we will no longer be carrying those inflationary factors. Just to let y'all know. So, Karen, thank you so much for yeah. this presentation. And I, I also agree that we need to uh, uh, post it 4265 and, and for all the reasons this council has said so. And I, I couldn't agree more that uh, uh, obviously uh, the tax rate has gone down year after year after year. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, a lot of the, the big cities that, that we work with and compete with every day are significantly higher than us. And so I, I appreciate all the work that you do. And uh, at the same time, I'm very sensitive to the amenities and the services that we provide because that really makes this the city of excellence. And we want that to continue. We know Plano, uh, the development of Plano has been around for 50, 60, 70 years. And so those are things you have to stay on top of. Uh, this is not a brand new city and we have to make That's sure true. that we keep it a quality city. So anyway, I appreciate you doing that. Mm -hmm. I know we have uh, future meetings to, to talk about how we can uh, uh, continue to improve areas that uh, need, need look, looking at and we'll do that on Saturday and then the future meeting in, uh, in August. Okay, here's what I need tonight. I need a record vote. Okay. I also need, it sounds like you're going with the 42.65. Since we're posting that way, we do need to announce a public hearing. The way Senate Bill 2 has it, we can have the public hearing on the same night as you adopt the tax rate. And that's what y'all did last year. It'd be on September 12th. If you decide you want it at another meeting, that's fine too. But I do have to include that on the posting. Okay. So uh, could I have a show of hands that uh, are in favor of posting at 42.65 cents? No, this, this is a, just a direction. How, it's got to be a record yeah, vote. A record so how, vote. I don't know what, whatever a record vote is. Okay. All right. The public hearing. I'll make a motion that we uh, use the uh, posted rate of 0.4265 with a public hearing on September 12th. Second. Thank you. I have a motion a second uh, to approve agenda item number five. Please vote. Motion passes eight to zero. Thank you. Uh, Great. Next item. Item number six, discussion of the proposed fiscal year 2022-23 community investment program. Okay, this is very timely. We're going to be discussing the community investment program. It totals $330 million. We have set speakers. I will bring up Ron Smith. He will discuss the parks and rec side first. Oh, so sorry. 330 million, of course, the majority is going to your street improvement projects of 127 million. 52 million is capital maintenance. Parks and recreation is 44 million. Water and sewer projects total 42 million for this next year. Okay, we have several different funding categories, and I'm just going to go ahead and bring up Ron. There you go, Ron. Thank you, Karen. Good evening again, City Council. The uh, Plano Parks and Recreation CIP, we have five categories shown on the slide here for your reference. We have recreation centers, park improvements, capital maintenance fund, park fee, and municipal drainage. Within these five categories, we have 85 projects totaling approximately 59 million or 18% of the city's CIP for this coming fiscal year. 
The first category is recreation centers. We only have one item in this fund, the renovation of the Tom Muhlenbeck Recreation Center. Funding will pay for design and a portion of the construction in fiscal year 22-23, with the remainder for construction in the following fiscal year. Anticipated work will include updates to fire, sound, lighting, and irrigation systems, replacement of the roof, parking lot lights, classroom and walking track flooring, refreshing the pool deck, slides, play features, and shade structures and new interior paint. Park improvement projects, much larger category. This slide is a high level list of just some of the projects that uh, we have in this category. We've also included in your packet tonight a memo that has more information for each one of these projects. You will notice in the memo that the majority of park improvement projects have either the word renovation or something similar that as our city manager has requested, our focus is on keeping our amenities up to snuff. And so the majority of our projects are renovation in nature. Uh, just a few that I wanted to highlight, Jack Carter Park, this project will implement phase one of the park's updated site master plan. There used to be a maintenance building at this location. We're gonna be repurposing that ground for public park use. Also of note, Los Rios Park, this project will construct nearly two miles of new trail in the formerly Los Rios golf course that will connect Bob Woodruff Park to the Cottonwood, Cottonwood Creek Greenbelt. Also of note, recreation trails will include new trail extension along Chisholm Trail from 15th Street down to the Collin Creek Mall development. Community park renovations will include projects at Old Shepherd Place Park and Bob Woodruff Park to replace the playgrounds and restrooms. And trail replacement will reconstruct a section of Chisholm Trail under Spring Creek Parkway that has been a maintenance bugaboo for us for many years. Of particular note in the park improvements is the Breckenridge Trail that I wanted to mention. This is expected to cost one and a half million dollars in next year's CIP budget. This project will be 100% reimbursed via grants from the Texas Department of Transportation. The next category is Capital Maintenance Fund, our CMF. We're again showing just a high level summary of the CMF with more information in your packet memo. The Capital Maintenance Fund supports smaller projects like repairs and rehabilitation, as well as renovation of facilities. This fund supports our award-winning park system, including four performing arts venues, 15 athletic sites, over 500 irrigation systems, five miles of living screens, 85 parks, and landscaping for 47 public buildings and also our six recreation centers. Funding is also included in the CMF for a project to renovate the exterior courtyard at the Plano Event Center. The next category is park fee projects. We anticipate projects in area six for Collin Creek Mall redevelopment, trail connections in area four, Hoblitzell Park and area eight at Jack Carter Park and area 12 for the Almanac development. Municipal drainage is our next category, and the last one to talk about for our Parks and Recreation CIP. This fund most significantly, uh, the most significant project in this fund is the Big Lake Park for the desiltation of the pond and repairing the weir, which is gonna be approximately 2.2 million. And the remaining funding is available for design and repair work citywide. Some of these locations could include Archgate, Russell Creek Park, Shady Brook, and Willow Creek. And again, the companion memo was provided for your convenience. I'll be happy to answer any questions about the Parks and Recreation CIP before we bring up our next speaker. Thank you, Ron. <clears throat> All right, and good evening again. Caleb Thornhill, Director of Engineering. And now we're going to talk about engineering, in particular streets. Uh, as you can see, that's a very large number, 119 million in bond funds. 
and uh, just over eight million in other funds, uh, Collin County RTR. Uh, and that's a combination of public works and engineering, but obviously uh, 127, nearly $130 million for street improvements uh, for the next fiscal year. Uh, project types we include with that, uh, street reconstruction or street construction, uh, capacity improvements, we'll have a slide on that. That's our intersection improvements. Uh, street design projects. Uh, this year we've got a special side, uh, transportation design that's always included in our budget, but there's a few items I wanted to, to point out uh, in particular. And then miscellaneous, that's gonna be our bridge repairs, screening walls, sidewalks, that type of projects. So street construction, I showed you on the first slide, $87 million, 50 of that is public works. And uh, Dan Prendergast, public works director, will talk a little more in detail about the arterials. Uh, the engineering department is doing work on two large arterials, Parker Road uh, reconstruction will start later this fall. It's in design right now. I uh, anticipate construction starting this fall. And then Shiloh Road on the east side of town is actually under construction right now. Um, that is a, a very large project, one of the biggest ones that I have seen since I have been here in my eight years. Uh, and then we've got several other streets planned for construction later this fall uh, and early next year as well. Just showing you a map. Uh, I know it's kind of difficult to see, but you can see there in the blue is projects that are existing construction, uh, under construction last fiscal year may lead into a little bit of next year. The red is what we anticipate for new construction uh, in the upcoming fiscal year. So uh, we've tried to share it everywhere we could, um, but we've got a lot of projects going on. Street capacity, talked about that a little bit earlier. Intersection improvements, uh, probably our most challenging project, uh, trying to get easements, right away utilities at these corners. Uh, if you're not familiar or don't remember intersection improvements, we do these usually for two main reasons. Uh, one, and probably most important, is safety. Uh, and that may be a geometry change, a site distance issue, and a location where we've got um, a high, high accident location. Uh, and then the other one, obviously, is congestion. Um, and usually what you'll see at, those, at these is the addition of some turn lanes, uh, but we also may make some uh, geometry modifications depending on safety conditions. Uh, Park Parker Legacy there on the right corridor, that's multiple locations along those corridors. Uh, hoping to wrap up Park and Parker uh, this year. And, uh, and we've got Legacy under bid and we're waiting some more utility relocations to get that one. Uh, you can see there on the left though, we've got numerous other intersections planned uh, for the next year. From a map perspective, it's everywhere. Uh, again, blue is under construction currently uh, and hopefully wrapping up in the next, uh, uh, later this fall and next year. Uh, red is what we anticipate being under construction next year. So there's, there's not a safe route to go. We've got it just about all covered, but uh, we are trying to coordinate uh, between our projects, public works, parks, the other departments uh, to make sure there is a route to get through the city, um, but it is a challenge for sure. Street design, uh, these are projects we anticipate going design next year. Uh, 15th Street is actually already under, uh, under design, excuse me. Uh, and that's just right outside the door here. I uh, expect that to wrap up design this next fiscal year and start construction. The remainder of those projects are usually are, are some type of neighborhood uh, street replacement, uh, usually includes storm drainage, water, sewer, along with those projects as well. So I mentioned transportation projects, uh, have a huge initiative going on right now. Um, we've just about completed the transportation or traffic management center uh, upstairs. If you haven't been yet, I'd encourage you to swing by. Um, got a few more things that they've got to uh, get complete material shortages. I'm sure you've heard that before. Um, a lot of technology in that room, but we're very excited. And with that, uh, we've got several planned improvements, uh, not only for this year, but for the next four years or three and a half. Uh, CCTV expansion, this enables us to, to see the intersections better, react to congestion, react to incidents. Um, the phase four fiber increases uh, our ability to communicate with these locations make real-time adjustments depending on what's going on. Uh, right now we rely on a lot of cell uh, service and, 
It can be spotty at times, so this fiber connections will really Im improve that. Um, the transportation technology program that was approved at last count council, the program management to manage this, the total programs upwards of 37 million uh, over the next four years. Vehicle detection uh, that was approved recently at council uh, that enables us to uh, essentially see the intersections. They can uh, detect vehicles at each of the intersections, make adjustments to the, uh, the signal timing uh, to account for those vehicles at those intersections. The traffic cabinet, uh, local controller and central system. So imagine uh, you see that box there in that picture. That's essentially the brain of that signal. Uh, and imagine that every one of those brains is a 1999 Dell. Uh, and that's kind of where we're at in a lot of the locations throughout the city. So that program, the cabinet, local controller and central system, that is a complete replacement throughout the city. So that's We've got over 260 uh, intersections throughout the cities that will not be done overnight. Um, and what they will do is they'll come in and set a new box while the other one's still operation, get it functioning, and then switch them over uh, so we won't see any downtime or a very minimal downtime. But that's what that is. That is a huge initiative, and we're very excited to move forward with that. Street miscellaneous, again, talked about this before. Uh, bridge inspection repair is a huge chunk of this. Uh, anywhere we have dark spots, street lighting, uh, we look at that. Uh, screening walls is probably the biggest chunk for a piece of pie from this um, area. Um, the screening walls are just large projects, very expensive. Uh, sidewalk installation repair, any gaps that we have throughout the city, and then the monumentation survey. Screening wall, again, talked about that. This is a, a list of locations and actually one was suggested and it's already on the list at P, uh, planning and zoning um, last week. Uh, municipal drainage fund, erosion control projects. You guys might be familiar with that. We've talked about that a little bit. Uh, this is what we have planned for the upcoming year. Uh, all of these in various states of uh, design and construction. And then another one you're probably familiar with, the Collin Creek is actually under construction uh, right now. Uh, so that's why that you see this, the other portion of this drainage fund, so large $20 million, that includes the completion of the Collin Creek culverts. And if you don't remember, that total project was $23 million. Uh, so a large portion of that. The other projects are miscellaneous drainage locations that we're addressing. Water improvement fund, uh, copy and replace just about every neighborhood that we uh, haven't touched yet. A lot of these are replacing uh, cast iron, older lines. Uh, Mayor Munns mentioned some of our infrastructure and the age of it. So these are all water rehab projects that we're doing throughout the city. And then lastly for me, sewer improvement fund. Uh, a lot of these are related to sewer capacity, a large line along uh, PGBT that we're enlarging. Uh, some improvements we're doing at Collin Creek um, and then the, uh, the Spring Creek Interceptor as well. And with that, is there any questions for me before I turn it to facilities? Council Member Grady. Uh, quick question, Caleb. Is there any of the projects that you have on the list um, something that we could uh, do in partnership from a funding standpoint with the North Central Texas Council of Governments? Um, so we explore those opportunities. Um, we'd have to really dig in. Uh, they do have, you know, of course we're involved with the surface transportation technical committee. Um, but usually the challenge we have with the funding is it adds time and it adds money to it. So if it's a larger project, we look at that shallow road, um, we're utilizing Collin County funding for that. Um, that we do have a couple of the corridor intersection projects are using RTR funds, uh, but our last federal project was the Preston at PGBT project. So currently we don't have one. Yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you. Thanks, Caleb. Good evening. Buckland's a facilities division manager, and I can promise you my projects will not mess up the intersection and cause any traffic. <laughs> I want that on the record. <laughs> <laughs> so I have um, 
roughly $37 million this year, spanning about 53 projects between my bond funds and capital maintenance. Highlight of some of the bond level projects we're gonna be working on this year, fueling, the fueling stations. We are getting ready to enter our, um, our agreement for design. We've done a lot of research, met with um, Fort Worth, and we really understand where we wanna go with it. Fire Station 5, we are about to sign our architect and we expect to you know, be under construction in, during this next year. Council Chambers Renovations, I know I spoke to you last year about this particular project. It's been a long process. We've had lots of meetings. We've looked at a lot of other cities' council chambers and um, we are expecting our first deliverable design in the next week or two. So um, from there, we'll be able to get our, our construction manager to give us price, make sure we're still within budget and see if we can't get down into construction just a little bit. Parkway service fleet renovation. Um, this project is slated to begin this year, but we are hitting pause right now on it and looking at possibly doing a master plan to make sure we are doing it in the best possible way. And then we have about 2.9 other bond related projects this year. So one thing I want everybody to understand, um, Ron had a lot of parks projects or rec center projects up on his. Um, a lot of the projects they will go and get the funding for and then have the facilities division build the actual project, especially if it's a rec center. Also, a lot of the capital maintenance for a lot of the stuff within the rec centers, say the, um, the rooftop mechanical units, um, refreshment of the showers, stuff like that, those are all done by facilities. So I want you to understand, if you see slides, me talking about rec centers and Ron talking about rec centers, it's, we're not double dipping, there's, there's a separation there. So a couple samples of municipal projects we're doing this year, the ongoing refreshment of this building through all the different suites, through the furniture replacement and some of the finishes. Um, you're gonna see a lot of generators. Um, we're still responding to winter storm URI. We haven't got one generator yet that we ordered, but the um, you know, average generator is 54 week lead time right now. So we're ahead of a lot of them, we're waiting on a lot of them. And this is the next generation we're looking at trying to We've serviced pretty much all the first responder. Now our next generator is trying to get all the warming stations going. We've got, we're trying to replace the overhead door controls. This is an interesting project for all of our fire stations. Fire has a unique ability that they want a truck to pull up to a certain bay in a station, hit a button, and that truck door goes open. Doesn't matter which station it is, doesn't matter which truck it is. Same thing for the engine, same for the ambulances creates a real issue. The technology we've been doing is no longer supported. So we have a new technology we're gonna be using similar to what's in your toll tag, but we're, we're using the badge technology that we use, the card reader technology. And it's gonna send a frequency uh, and uh, radio frequency to the doors and open them up. So that's what that particular project is. We've also got $250,000 this year to do a space study for the police headquarters in preparation for a possible bond request in 25. The Tom Muhlenbeck Center, I'll keep it quick, Ron hit most of this stuff already. Biggest thing is hitting the locker rooms. Locker rooms are dated. They really need to be finished, fixed. Um, got a few ADA issues. You to try and really get some new aquatics features in there, get it refreshed, you know, make some um, people more excited to come there again. New things to come see. Fire Station 5 remodel, I touched on that a minute ago. This project we hope to get going within this, this, this fiscal year. Biggest thing is creating more room for more apparatus. Um, we've decided that I think they're gonna be moving a med unit into the station, which doesn't currently have one. Um, it's gonna, we're gonna rearrange the station itself to um, increase the response efficiency. Of course, the code now requires us to spend any kind of time doing anything to a first responder. We've gotta add a storm shelter on it. And we have a few ADA issues. And of course, this project again, um, last year you guys heard what we were trying to do, try and improve the accessibility first and foremost, increase the audio and acoustical 
abilities and obviously improve security while we're in here. And Dan's up next, but before I walk away, are there any questions for facilities? Any questions? Thank you, sir. Okay, thank you. Good evening, Mayor and Council. My name is Dan Prendergast, Director of Public Works, here to give you a quick overview of our 2022-23 CIP. The largest component of our CIP is, of course, streets. We've talked about that a lot tonight. With a total funding of just over $80 million, split between bond funding of $50.7 million and CMF funding of just over $29 million. When we talk about bond-funded projects versus um, CMF-funded projects, bond-funded projects are our large capital projects that stretch over multiple years. Our CMF-funded projects are typically smaller projects based on um, work orders and also preventative maintenance and screening walls as well. And I'll talk more about all this as we go through the presentation. The voters approved uh, $231 million for street bond uh, projects in 2021. $100 million was devoted to arterial concrete repair and overlay and $70 million to residential street repair. So it's $170 million that goes to public works. This first project here is $25.7 million next year for arterial concrete repair and overlay. The picture you see here was Independence Parkway, our first overlay that we did about five years ago. Uh, it's performed very well and that's how we expanded the program into what it is today. And this slide here will kind of show you what that is. This is an overview of our major street program. It shows you kind of where we've been, where we are, and where we're going with the street program. The streets you see in gray are overlays that have been completed already. On the west side of the town, you've got Windhaven Parkway. Central town, you've got Parker Road from Preston to Independence. And you've got the Independence Parkway project I just mentioned that goes north-south there. And then on the far east side, you've got Jupiter Road that goes from Park to Chaparral. That was the last um, overlay that we finished last year. The projects in yellow are previous concrete repair projects that we're now uh, getting ready to overlay. So Legacy Drive from Custer to 75 should start construction on the overlay in about two weeks. And then they're gonna shift over to Plano Parkway in the southwest corner of town. That should start construction here in about three to four weeks. And then finally, Coit Road, they're doing final touch-up concrete repairs right now. That should start construction in September. And all three projects will wrap up uh, by the end of October. So you've got funding in this fiscal year and next fiscal year for those projects. Uh, next are the orange projects. These are concrete repair projects that we're doing ahead of the overlays. So you've got Parker Road east and west in the central part of town. Both of those have started construction uh, and the contractors are moving from the outside of town inside there. So you may see some lane closures and that stretches over multiple fiscal years. In the, on the southeast corner of town, you've got Plano Parkway. Uh, we had to wait for a few projects to move, to, to move out of the way, but we have started construction on that project on the east part of the town. Uh, next, Hedgecoax Road up north. Uh, that project uh, had a pre-construction meeting, I believe, last week and should start construction next week. And then Independence Parkway is in final design. That project uh, should bid in a few weeks and then go to construction here in about three months. And that's intentional to make sure that we're following Coit Road and not having two parallel projects under construction at the same time. So that's really the overview of where our street program is going. Um, I should mention too, in green there, you've got Parkwood Boulevard as well. That was a concrete repair project last year that finished up. So that will be overlaid uh, this fiscal year. So that's a good overview. Um, I also wanna point out too, that we, we do try to do projects all over town. It's not just in one location to make sure all of our residents get to experience the overlay. It's not just one area of town. I think we're doing a pretty good job with that. Next is the residential street and alley rehab. So these are done by zones that are about one square mile. We've got $25 million for next year. Uh, what we do is a contractor goes street by street and repairs the street pavement, the sidewalk pavement, and the alley pavement, and then we do preventative maintenance on the entire neighborhood. So it gets every piece of street pavement gets um, maintenance performed to it. The map here shows you where we are right now in green. Uh, we're in a lot of locations, and these are projects, again, that stretch typically about two years, sometimes even three, depending on how much work there is to do. And then in red are projects coming up for next year. So you've got D6 on the west side of town, and then uh, K8 and L8 kind of in the north part of town there. And both the, or both the areas there have not had a previous um, neighborhood zone project, so it's the first time. The streets there are about 25 to 30 years old, so it's about time to get in there and do some maintenance. Next is the CMF projects. So most of these are the same type of projects, a smaller scale. I will point out here the joint ceiling and under ceiling that allows us to maintain even pavement that's in good shape to make sure it stays in good shape longer. And then screening walls. Uh, we have a lot of vehicles that do hit screening walls and this funding here pays for us to replace those panels. 
Uh, in addition, if, this, if the wall is in poor condition, but the, the foundation is in good condition, we can replace the brick and that's paid for out of this fund. But with, with public works, um, if the foundation is not in good condition, meaning the wall is leaning, it goes to engineering as paid for in bond funds. The next part of the CMF is the traffic portion. Uh, it includes signalization upgrades, pavement markings, street condition investigations, street lighting, uh, traffic guardrails and traffic sign replacement. And all this allows us to keep our traffic and signage in good shape uh, each year. Next, we'll switch gears over to water. Uh, what you see on the right here is a 24 inch water main break that's being repaired. That was on 15th Street, just east of Custer Road last year. Um, a lot of the funding here with that $7.2 million is going towards condition investigation of our large remains. Our, our, our mains are getting older. We've done a great job, as you saw on Caleb's slide there, doing um, neighborhood rehabs. Those are typically eight inch to 12 inch diameter mains. We need to look at our larger diameter mains too to make sure that we're, we're not gonna have any catastrophic failures. Um, the other portion here too is important is the water quality. As we switch to a five year rolling average with a district, it's important that we're looking at our water quality flushing. The only way that we can maintain water quality right now in the system is to flush fire hydrants. Um, I know that can be um, a little irritating to residents <laughs> sometimes. Um, so we're, we're doing a water model right now with a consultant to where they can look at various scenarios and how, how we use our pump stations, turning valves in the systems, um, decreasing water main sizes, and also potentially chlorine dosing and ammonia dosing in our tanks to raise the residual instead of having to flush that water out of the system. Um, so that's all part of that $7.2 million. Also includes major water line repair and leak detection. And we're also in our last year of the water meter replacement project. And then finally, wastewater. Uh, this is just over $6 million. Most of these projects are related to our CMOM plan, which is capacity uh, management operations and maintenance. Uh, it's really geared towards the condition of our overall sewer system, making sure that we're doing CCTV inspections, which is what you see there on the right side. Uh, it also is geared towards making sure we're looking at I and I. Um, if you've got storm water in your sewer lines, you have less capacity for sewer. Um, so a lot of these projects are geared towards that, like manhole sealing, I and I studies, and flow meter programs. So that's really kind of the gist of the overall public works program. And with that, I will open up to questions. And I think I'm the last one. Yes. Not to keep anybody, everybody here longer than necessary, but <clears throat> you pointed out that our uh, water lines are aging as are our streets. Um, we passed a huge bond package last year, um, the brunt of which was four streets because everybody recognized that, uh, as I say, the warranty's up. Sure. And there was a lot, of, um, a lot of work that just has to be done. But as our city was built out in some significant bursts in the 80s and 90s, we didn't have to worry about most of those streets, which we spent gobs of money to build, and we just drove on them for many years. Last year's bond package, which we're uh, spending money on, is addressing just a fraction of our infrastructure. How likely do you think it is, and this is probably a much deeper discussion, how likely do you think it is that we're going to have to maintain this current level of spending which we issued bonds to achieve as we address all the remaining fractions? I would say it's likely um, because we are an aging city, you know, and, and we are addressing the street issues right now. Uh, the one bond program doesn't address all of our issues. Uh, there's no way you can do that amount of work in that amount of time. Um, but you've also got your sewer system and your water system. Uh, what this CIP is doing here is getting us in, in a position to look at how much that we're going to have to spend because we haven't done that before. Mayor and Council, I'd, I'd also share that you're exactly right. We grew in bursts. And as the, the late Jerry Cosgrove used to say, um, he needed more, and we've added more in. Um, I think the challenge is, and, and you know, Plano is working hard to make sure that we don't suffer the fate of, of a lot of cities that haven't stayed on top of their maintenance, <clears throat> haven't repaired their infrastructure. Um, the water and sewer side is growing more and more concerning um, in the long term, and it's something that we've started to address. We are going to need to uh, address each year and bring that back to council. Where we are on roads right now, we're adding some positions to make sure that we can, um, we can address the needs of, of the community, but we're bumping up on capacity to some extent, mm -hmm. uh, so that's a good thing. But long term, uh, our goal is to stay on top of the wave versus being behind the wave uh, as far as maintenance goes and keeping our conditional assessment uh, acceptable within the community. So we're committed to that. And as we need more resources or other bond programs or whether it's uh, water and sewer discussions, we're going to have to bring those back. And, and I know that those, to your point, Councilman, are costly. But if we want to keep up with that maintenance and not have that deferred cost that balloons on us in the future that makes it prohibitive, 
we're going to have to be able to take those on in, in the upcoming years. And to that end, and you may already be uh, heading down this track, <clears throat> if we're going to have to maintain something like the current level of spending, which we only achieved with bond issuances, <clears throat> I'd like to start exploring um, ramping up this spending on an operational basis over the coming decades so that we're not spending extra money on debt service. We're happy to bring back uh, options for spending uh, funds in, in a way that's the most uh, responsive and controlled and, and works within uh, the goals of the city. But I do think that over the next uh, four to five years, it's going to be critically important that we do meet those needs and we do have a plan to address those over the next uh, 10 to 15 years. Okay. Thank you. Councilman Grady. Um, one quick question, um, and it deals with either current spending or it deals with the spending that you're talking about in the future, and that deals um, with Coit Road. Um, we extended the amount of construction that we were going to do on Coit Road, um, and we extended what we were going to cover with an asphalt overlay. In the process, Mother Nature has not been kind to the early reconstruction of Coit Road, and some of those new sections have now been shifted by mother nature <laughs> in portions. So I'm just wondering is, the, in, is repairing those sections before you put an asphalt overlay in the current dollars or is it in this future dollars? So we actually planned for that. Um, with the asphalt overlay project that we bid, we had concrete repair again and that knowing that some of those sections had been repaired probably about two years ago. Uh, and then we had the freezes and we had the um, su summer heat as well. So they're, they're back out there right now actually working on, on the concrete repairs ahead of the overlay going down to make sure the concrete is in great condition before it goes down. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Is that all, Karen? That's it for us today. All right. Well, well that we'll being... Yeah, thanks for reminding us. Um, <laughs> More coffee. <laughs> there being no further business, meeting's adjourned. <laughs>